Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of Origin Story, where we dive into how your favorite YouTubers got started and where they are going. I am Mike. And I'm JP. And today we are joined by Ted Ward and very excited to have you here today. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. I'm great. Fantastic. I'm, yeah, I'm very excited for this one. It'll be really fun. We just spent about 30 minutes uh, just chatting and it was super fun. Super great to get to kind of know you before we started recording. And so um, in tonight's episode, we're going to learn a little bit about Ted's past and why he decided to start a YouTube channel. It might surprise some of you who are current followers, because I don't think it was the reason the channel started that you think we will get there, though. Um, for those who don't know our guest, Ted is the man behind the channel, Tedward. He is a POV driver giving you a different kind of car review on YouTube the truest driving experience. It's pretty awesome. I, we were talking about this before we started recording. It was a breath of fresh air to see not the standard Toyota, Toyota Tacoma and Tundra and new uh, Mercedes SUV, which there is some, one on your channel, but you know, it was good to see those, the breath of fresh air and have a true driving experience. So he breaks the mold of most driving channels, not sticking with the newest cars too, but he does have them. But, you know, you get to see the driving experience of a 1948 Willys Jeep with rusted outside panels and floor, something I would have never understood and wanted to drive, but now I definitely want to. Drifting a Lamborghini in the snow and so many other cool cars. Um, what was the car we were talking about before we started with the engine all the way in the front? Oh, the Lancia Fulvia uh, 1.3 S Sport Zagato Coupe. That's a mouthful, but <laughs> right. I, and I would have never ever found that car if it wasn't for watching your channel. And I, now I just want to drive cars like that um, through the roads of Massachusetts because there's some great <laughs> driving roads out there. Um, his love for cars and his driving experience is obvious on his channel, as well as his love for technology and breaking this mold. So his channel is home to over 200,000 subscribers who have watched his 606 videos over 50 million times. Thank you so much for joining us today. And by the way, guys, if you could hit the subscribe button, like this video and head over to his channel and subscribe there. It really helps both of us fulfill our dreams. Sorry for the longer intro, but I'm very excited for this. Um, so let's start with what we just kind of talked about growing up in Massachusetts. Uh, the all four seasons, was it always about driving on very fun, kind of tight? You don't have straight, like it's not like Florida, right? Everything's straight. You get on a freeway. You got beautiful driving roads up and down elevation changes. Is that what kind of got you into driving, the experience of it? Yeah, I mean, I was, first of all, thanks for the very kind intro. And I did not know that I had broken 50 million views. So that made me really happy. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I was born a car enthusiast. This was not like a, a, a thing that I discovered later in life. Like there was never a moment in my life where cars were not my focus. And I know if you're watching this on video, I'm in like a basement. I promise you it's for the <laughs> sake of audio. It looks insane, but that's fine. That's kind of what my channel is all about. It's always the honest take of the reality for the sake of <laughs> quality. <laughs> there it is. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, as a kid, like we, I grew up in pretty rural Massachusetts outside of Boston. Um, and it's a small state, but it's, you know, it, if you're not directly in the city, especially back in the nineties, I mean, you were in some country ass country. There's not much out here. I grew up in a town with 5,000 people. Wow. Um, so I can, you know, there's, there's great roads out here, but, uh, for me, I was just obsessed with cars. I could name every car when I could talk. All I wanted to do is drive my sister's like power wheels, fire engine. Um, and I couldn't sit in a seat and reach the pedal. So I would lay down and I was driving this before I could walk. Um, and my dad would detune Perfect. it. He would literally like remove the high speed fuse from it. And I'd stare at him because I, I couldn't talk, but I knew something was off. <laughs> like, I knew this is not going as fast as it used to go. Um, but that's the deal. I mean, I, there's just never been a moment in my life where I was not just enthralled and obsessed with a car. It, yeah. I, I see but, that like now, hold on, sorry, JP. I see that now, especially with what you just said about like removing the fuse and not being able to express yourself. But my son is the same way. He would understand it immediately. His number one word is car. I don't know why boys, it happens to little boys and girls, but like they get obsessed with it. And every toy he wants to play with is a car. I can only imagine what it'll be like for him later on in life. So I'm excited that you said that. It was really cool. 
Yeah. And that's what I was wondering too. So like growing up, I mean, getting into cars, uh, maybe it's just this innate thing that happens. You get toys or whatever growing up, but what about like your mom, your dad, your family, were they into cars? Was your family into cars? Like, tell us a little bit about that growing up. Cause I know for me, you know, I would always like, I'd be the kid in the garage at night who's sitting in the car, like has the keys parents, like don't turn that car on, do not start it, but you can go like tinker around in there. You know what I mean? Like yeah, that's kind of how I got that, that introduction into cars. Was that, what was that like for you? I lived in the garage sitting in my dad's 1972 Corvette. It's a 454 vet right before the emissions killed it. So it's Chrome bumpers, front and rear. It's like a mm-hmm. proper, the proper vet, uh, convertible AC car, alarm system, power windows, very odd car. Like it was like a showroom special, like, you know, uh, there's my, my mom's brother's car and then my dad brought, bought it from him. So my, you know, my whole family is just kind of into cars. And my mom being from South Boston kind of grew up in like a rough neighborhood. Her brother was really into cars. So it was just part of the family. It was just what they did. He always had road. My uncle always had road runners. My dad usually had like little cars. Like uh, Mm -hmm. he had two rabbits, two Scirocco's. His first car was a Triumph TR3A. And then he had a PH 1800 and all kinds of funky stuff. But because of that, and he's very stubborn and hands-on and, uh, you know, I wouldn't say he's, he's not like a macho guy, but you know, he wants to do everything himself. Right. And that meant that nothing got done at a shop. So I watched him for my whole childhood, maintaining and keeping our cars alive in our driveway, in our garage. Um, so, you know, I always was exposed to the mechanical thing, but I just, I just wanted to drive. Like I was, it was cool. Like, you know, I'll do my brakes, I'll do an oil change. But like, for me, it was about the result. Like for him, it was the pride of working on the car. For me, I just, I needed to operate the machine. Yeah. And and so, and that's right. That's the way it is. So I also like when, when you look at your dad, when he was like that, so was your dad, um, and we'll talk about this more, but was he an engineer? Like, how was he so mechanically inclined? Like, how did he get started in that? Were you the kid with the flashlight? You know, I think he was we... stubborn and cheap. Like he, <laughs> he went to, he, you know, he, he had some learning disabilities cause he's dyslexic and he went to like a special high school to get his degree. It took him an extra year. And then he, I think he did one year of college and dropped out and he was working in some sort of industry, but in, you know, just like on an assembly line somewhere, but he was doing all this while he was working on his own cars and keeping his cars alive. Uh, he eventually fell into a career of selling microscopes and got really good at that. And that's how he kind of made his money and did his thing. Um, but you know, I think because he was just never afraid to, to figure something out. Uh, whereas I'm the opposite, like I'm a mechanical engineer, but like I look at stuff and I, I know enough to know what it is, which also means I know enough that it's fragile and I'll probably break it. So, <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> yeah, like, that's if I was a, if I was a little dumber, I think I would take on a lot more projects. Yeah. I love the necessity of having to figure it out and be like the way to be cheap. Cause like I've made the mistake of buying, um, I, I would buy cars after I graduated from college. I, you know, I bought a 2006, uh, BMW X5 4.8 IS. And if you know anything about those N62s and the, and everything that goes wrong with the air suspension, and everything, it's like, you it's like, if you're going to be, if you're going to be dumb, if you can't be hand, this is what it is. If you can't be handsy, uh, handsome, you better be handy. So I figured out how to be <laughs> handy real quick. Right. And just learning how to fix this. And I was a ne- necessity because I was, I was a college kid who bought this car and didn't know anything about it. And I was like, well, now I got to fix it. I can't take it into a BMW dealership. I, you know, I had a, I had a $17,000 quote one time from BMW and I was like, oh, this is not, this is not good. So Ooh. I got to start figuring it out on my own. Yeah, uh, but no, I, I love that. I, I feel like, and that's also something that I, I think, uh, I think a lot of people like from your channel too, is like kind of just the understanding and just and getting to know a little bit more about the inside of the car stuff. So we'll, we'll dive, we'll dive into more of that. But. I want to ask about the cars in Massachusetts and, and, and in your family. So it seems like it was very sports car, Sunday driver, fun vehicles to do. I, other than watching you drift a uh, uh, Lamborghini Huracan per, performante in the snow in Boston, I wouldn't expect to have sports cars in the snow. So what, what, what happened in the winter Were they just, is that like the project time? Is that what the rebuild time? What, what happened kind of then? Yeah. So for us, like my, my parents always had pretty conservative cars. I mean, the Corvette is like, that's a long story. That's that actually has not been on the road since 1986. So it went into the garage essentially when I was born and it, I've never driven that car. I've never even ridden in that car and it's sitting about 30 feet from me right now. Yeah. Very sad story, but I think it drove me to buy some crazy stuff because I was like, you know, if we're not going to have this, I'm going to get something else. So 
Um, you know, but as far as winter goes, yeah, the, the car culture in New England is really interesting. There's certainly less convertibles. Um, but then I always thought growing up that everybody, I thought everybody's parents had a sports car in the garage. Like, I just thought that was a normal thing. So when I was little, like, you know, first, second, third grade, you'd go to somebody's house. And the first thing I wanted to see was like, what do you got in the garage? Like, what's your dad have? Yeah. <laughs> and you come to find out nobody had anything. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like, like I had one friend whose dad had a, uh, I think it was a model a, a Ford model a, which is cool. And he used to like take me home in the rumble seat, which was really cool. Yeah. Um, but other than that, like, you know, I, I did not grow up in a wealthy town. I grew up in a town that was like very, just kind of ordinary middle-class people had like Lincolns and Cougars and some Toyotas, maybe, maybe a Honda here and there, but even then like Hondas were kind of looked down on, um, at the time, like, we weren't a right. Honda town. We were like, you had an Oldsmobile or a Buick. Yeah. It would have kill you to buy American. Absolutely. And every single, if I thought about my neighborhood, I live in like a very quaint little neighborhood where, you know, we could run and play and ride our bikes. No worries about getting hit by a car, but everyone had a Dodge caravan, uh, one of those Mercury, um, station wagons, um, or, you know, or, or a Lincoln continental. Like that was, that was the height. It was like, Ooh, somebody's yeah. got a promotion. They bought a continental. Like that was, <laughs> that was, that was what it was. <laughs> that was the height of luxury there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or a crown Vic, you know, it was unbelievable. Or yeah. Oh, yeah. You had the grand marquee, you were the hot shot. Yeah. yeah that's, that's, that's the grand marquee. Seats, man. You can't get, can't, can't get away from those. Yeah. No, right. that's awesome. Now, yeah, that, that's interesting though. I mean, it is, it is cool to see that I, there's a dude in my neighborhood who had, is working on, polar opposite vehicles. He's parks both of his cars outside. He has two Subaru daily drivers and the inside is a model a and a GTO. I'm like, man, you are on different spectrums of the world. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. But, yeah it wasn't well, until I was in my teenage years where that's when I got exposed to like BMWs. Um, right. We had a family friend up in Vermont who was, uh, the, this is like the first real driving I ever saw because I'd gone out for rides in a million cars. Cause when I was a kid, my dad would take me to car shows. We'd meet up with some of his friends who were still kind of like legitimate hot rodders. Like I, I, I we'd show up to a car show. His friend would pull in in like a 427 Cobra and he'd say, Oh, can you take him for a ride? And I was like 11. And the guy would say like, well, what do you want me to do? And my dad would lean in real quiet and just go, scare the shit out of them. <laughs> <laughs> and they would, I mean, these were like hell drives. These were the kind of drives where you're like, I didn't know cars could do this. And those so cars, you go, those cars still scare people. Well, still turn you know, So yeah. And, uh, and then, and then when I was like 14, 15, we went up to Vermont. I met this guy, John, who was a, it was a customer and a friend of my father's. And he had this 95, BMW 540i M Sport. Now the mm -hmm. M Sport back then meant something because what it was, they only made 200 for the US and it was a manual six speed. It was the 540i engine with a lot of M5 parts on it and a self-leveling right. rear suspension. Turbine two wheels, looked really hot. M5 mirrors, very yeah. cool. Um, and this was a guy who grew up in France and Italy and he drives like he grew up in France and Italy. Um, <laughs> like a maniac. Like he's, he's a nut. He's, 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 he's a scoff law in many States to this day. Um, not allowed to drive in a few States out West because what he would do, he was, he was a salesman as well. So he would, he would drive and he would just take this car and he would just sit like, you know, at the time, very quickly, like 120 miles an hour. And just, as he said, let it breathe. Uh, and he taught me how to drive. I mean, he really taught me like what it was to drive a car with respect at speed. Um, because at 16, he first, I drove with him a bunch of times when I was a kid as a passenger, and I was just so in love with this car. It's a V8 BMW. Then, uh, as a 16 year old with my permit, he let me drive the car. And the first time I drove that car, I was like, I'm a BMW guy. This is it, man. I'm in love. Um, and I think that's what kind of bred the need for my E39 M5 when I bought that a few years later. I got to yeah. tell you, the memory that you have, the, the, that is unbelievable. <laughs> like the, the, the vivid, you knew the, Freaking color of the in the mirror Arctic silver baby. Oh my! Like every <laughs> great, detail great of that color. car, it has to like you had to have hit goosebumps on your arms describing that vehicle. That's amazing. Oh, I do. And he was he was a carefree dude. I mean, I can remember him. I mean, we were in the middle of nowhere in Vermont. I can remember being a passenger in that car in the back seat with his daughter in the front while he hit second so hard that his beer tip over and he goes honey can you Excellent. clean that up and that's i mean that's <laughs> not that i would ever now that's massachusetts that, living 
<laughs> I'm like, that's, that's, the, that's that, that's that Italian vibe right there. That's that je ne sais quoi. You don't get that <laughs> elsewhere. Dude, that's fantastic. You know, and well, t- well, two things. One, that 540 IM sport right now, those still are. You look at your bringer trailers, you look at everywhere that they're selling. Those are really hot commodity right now, along with everything else. We can dive into that soon. Um, but I was going to say, was there, um, was there any other, or I guess, to, to bring it back to that, actually, because you seem like somebody obviously went into engineering. So like you're, you're very inquisitive. You want to learn um, when you're like riding in the car with those people, were you always, um, and, and maybe I say this cause I, I might've been like this as well, but like, were you always like taking a look at like the pedals and watching how he releases all I could think about shifts? Yeah. Um, so my, the first manual car I ever was in was my aunt's 1994 Volkswagen Golf. Okay. And my parents both had automatics. My dad had a, a 89 Volvo 740 station wagon. My mom had a 1990 Oldsmobile Delta 88. So those are the cars that I experienced as a kid. And when I got into my aunt's car, I remember I knew how a manual transmission worked because I had played with my dad's tractor and I understood that, but that's different because you're not articulating a throttle, you're setting a throttle and then you're using a hydraulic system to do the rest. Um, so I'm watching and, and I remember being like, how do you know when to shift? What's going on here? And I was asking a million questions. She's probably like driving. I probably drove her nuts. Um, but she was telling me, you just, I remember, I'll never forget her just saying, just, you just listen. You don't have to watch the tack. You can just listen to it and it'll tell you. And turns out that became my first car when I was 16, um, in 2004. So 10 years later, that was my car. Uh, right. and, 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 uh, and that's, I, and, at the age of 13 or four, I think I was 13 years old. Um, my, my, I was, I was kind of a chubby kid and I know my dad wanted me to be healthier. So I remember I was like, I I was obsessed with driving. He would take me out to parking lots to drive. And I said, I want to drive the Volkswagen because he, it was his, he, he got it from my aunt and then eventually passed it down to me. But I was like, I want to drive a stick. I really want to learn to drive a stick. And so he said, if you lose, you know, 10 pounds, you can drive a stick. I remember being like, okay, deal. He didn't think I was going to do, I lost 10 pounds. And I like I lost it in a week, by the way, pretty unhealthy. I don't recommend it. You know, yeah, it for wasn't young great. Children. <laughs> Not good. Um, I don't, I don't recommend telling your kids they're fat. Um, <laughs> uh, but that's great. Basically, basically he parked the, the car at one end of our driveway, which is fairly long. And he stood at the other end and I just drove it right to him. And he was like, Oh shit. Yeah. He was like, I didn't stall it. I just drove right to him. And he was like, Oh boy, here we go. And I'm like, cool. Now every weekend I'm going to beg you to go to an industrial park so I can go learn to heel toe downshift and all this other stuff. And that's what we did. That's what I did from age 14 to 16, basically. Yeah. And, and I was kind of like the same way. I, I, I remember I tried to get my dad when I was 15, when I turned 15 and I, and I grew up in Oregon. Um, I tried to get him to buy me, um, uh, at the time, uh, it was a 3000 GT VR4. And he's like, you have no idea how important that car is to me. <laughs> it's, it's so important to me that the, well, I mean, okay. So the Eclipse GSX, the 3000 GT VR4, and then yep. uh, Integra GSR. And I would just at 15 years old, kept trying to convince him, like, would you just buy one of these? Like, it seems like a good, you know, it's a great car, <laughs> you know, and this is like, uh, this is probably, oh gosh, I don't, I don't know what year it was. I don't know when I turned 15, I guess it'd be like 2003 would be around then. So it'd be like 2003. And I was like, trying to get in it at that time, it was like a, a Dodge stealth twin turbo or the 3000 GT VR four. And they were like 4,500 bucks for a decent one. Yeah. Yeah. And my dad's friend had a, had a VR four. And I remember that was one of the cars that I rode in when I was like 14, that he took me for a ride. He was not a good driver. And I knew enough at 14 that he was not a good driver. Um, but <laughs> like he tried to scare me. Like, <laughs> he like, they tried to scare me, but like he did scare me. Cause I was like, this is not car control. Right. Like, <laughs> this is how it's done. <laughs> He's trying to go like too fast and too hard. And you're like this, this we could actually crash. He's not being yeah, this cocky. Is, like, this is, we're getting dangerous here. Yeah. So a little Those, background though. I, um, I, I was a pilot, so I grew up flying airplanes. So at age 11 oh, wow. is when I started, I started flying when I was 11. So the, tr- the reason I think my parents had some trust in me with the, with the cars was just that I could fly a plane. I could land a plane. Yeah, so of course they, they were slightly more inclined to let me operate a vehicle knowing that I probably wasn't going to kill myself or them. Yeah. Far less dangerous yeah, than operating I, a plane and flying and landing and understanding taxing and control and working with the towers and all that stuff. Absolutely. Um, I'm sure obviously you probably had somebody with you, but at the same time, like now that's a mechanically inclined, that's where you are. It is a, is a ballet between an instrument and yourself and a mechanical understanding of physics, which is huge, which now 
is kind of my biggest piece because I feel like there's a lot of people on the road that just don't understand physics. And it's a it's no, a, they have they have so much trust in in, in physics and they're wrong. <laughs> yeah. they, they think their tires are like real. They think the limits of their car and their tires are so high. And I'm like, Oh, I watch some of these moves and I'm like, you have no idea how close you just were. Like that yeah. was it. That's all it had. That's it. Yeah. They, they need to learn about like one simple thing of inertia, right? Like, okay, you're going 75 or 80 in your car, by the way, it's going to go up against another car and it's going to hurt. You, doesn't matter how many airbags are in your car. It doesn't matter what's going on. You're, you're in for a, a world of not fun. Yeah. There's a lot of, it's wild. It's wild how much trust people have in their machines. And, uh, I mean, look, if you've ever like walked into a door at like a low (laughs) speed and been like, Oh my God, Oh my God, my head. It's like, what do you think happens at 70? Yeah. Yeah. And, like it's and, really bad. <laughs> and you're Blind not trust. walking into a wood door. You're walking into 5,000 pounds of metal. Like it's, it's horrible. Yeah. Yeah. People, it's, people have people, they don't really, we were like, you know, like when you get a fish at a, at a carnival and it's like in a little b- a bag of water. Yeah. Goldfish, like that, take it home. We, we are a bag of water. Like yeah. <laughs> there's nothing to us. We just are, are one poke away from certain death. It's really oh, very much. And that's, and that's why you have to hashtag respect the drive. Um, no. <laughs> yeah. We want to yeah. live. We want to get through. We want to survive the drive, you know? <laughs> no. And we'll, and we'll talk more about this. Cause I want to, when we talk about like getting into like your current channel and, and, and what you're doing and, and talking about all of these pieces um, really, really important. I think, because I think you bring something to the table that not a lot of the, not a lot of their channels do. So we'll, we'll talk about yeah. that when we get into it. Um, but Especially I, I, when you don't have 18 airbags and 47 safety items in a 1960s car, you might learn a little bit about driving a little safer <laughs> and nicer. So that's true. Before, before we get there, I think what, well, I want to do the same thing that JP is saying. Another thing that many of your fans probably know about you is that you did start college as the thought to become a doctor. Can you talk a little bit more about the where, where that came from? Was that just because small, small town mentality of kind of like, if you want to be big and you want to have a good car collection, got to be a doctor, a lawyer, own a business. Is that, is that what drove you to do that? I think I was following in my sister's footsteps. Cause she actually is a cardiologist now. Like she's like a good cardio. She's like a pediatric cardiologist who then went into like yeah. congenital Shit. heart. You have a, like, uh, she's like, you got a smart she's, sister too. She, oh, it sucks. Like she's so yeah. smart. Like <laughs> they always lead you down the wrong path. And you're like, wait, I can't do this. She was a valedictorian <laughs> of her, of her high school class. And like, you know, she was, I was, I was, I was like her, you know, as far as growing up, I was just her little brother. Like that's who I was in my, in my school. Um, and yeah, I mean, so I was kind of like, well, she's doing this. I could go into that. That's fine. And I was really into, um, I was really into biology. Like we're a very scientific kind of family. Like I grew up just, my dad worked in so many labs. So like, we would just always talk about cutting edge discoveries, whether it was in medicine or in, um, physics discoveries and things like that. Like a normal dinner time conversation would have been like string theory and like, uh, I don't know, like that's new discoveries in mitochondrial and RNA, you know, like that's, yeah. that's what would be going on. Um, not, not always, and, not always just isolating variables. You guys are on the cutting edge of like thought. <laughs> we love, it was fun. It was great. And, and like, you know, so she went that direction. Um, and, uh, you know, I thought, well, I guess I'll kind of do the same thing. I'll go pre-med, see what happens. I got into WPI, which was like my absolute dream school, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Um, if I didn't go there, I would have gone to University of Vermont, Burlington. Um, but I got in there, they gave me a bunch of money. So it was like, like less of a blow. And, uh, I started off with a bunch of bio classes and I was like doing these, I remember doing a micro bio class and I was like, this is kicking my ass. I was like, I think I know nothing about this. I don't like blood. What are you thinking? And then I'm looking around at all my friends who I just made at college and being like, well, they're all just mechanical engineers and civil engineers and industrial engineers. And I'm like, I like machines. Why the hell wouldn't I be a mechanical engineer? So I just switched yeah. up my course load and that was that. Especially like, what, math. Math. like technical. what's math, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Especially when you oh go to God. the technical I, institute, it's much easier to get surrounded by many engineers and go down that path. 
yeah, had I just gone to UBM, I probably just would have become a stoner who never became a doctor. Like, <laughs> yeah, or, or become like a communications major. No offense to any communication. No offense. No, but... no offense. That's, that's essentially my current job right now. <laughs> uh, it, it might have actually helped yeah. a little bit there. Yeah. So, so then you, you change. I had a similar thing in, in college. I wanted to be a doctor because my dad wanted to be a doctor and his dad wanted to be a doctor. So I was like, oh, maybe I'll do it. I took chem. I took chem in high school. I loved it. I took bio in high school. I loved all the physics. I got into chemistry one in college. And I was like, damn, this sucks. I cannot go down this path. I'm not even ready. So yeah, that's a Here rough baton visit. pass from the family. Yeah. Um, well, Cause I also did chemistry and I went pretty, I went pretty far at Oregon state in chemistry. And I was like, this is not for me. I got to find something else because no, I, I can, like, I can oh, do labs. Well, but I was like, Oh, I don't have a brain. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. an idiot. Like nothing made me feel more like an idiot than like, I could do the math, even though I'm not great at math, I could do the math because there's like logic to it and there's not yeah. much memorization. Like you just need to know how to get there. Like, yeah. whereas like chemistry felt more like here's like 90 pages of triptychs, which for our younger listeners was how you got places before GPS. <laughs> and, and it was like how you memorize it's like, it's like memorize every turn. And if you fuck yeah. it up, like nothing works in the universe. So you're, you just try to work. Yeah. 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 It's catastrophic. It, it exactly. It, it be, medical school is, I feel like, get that path is like, how well can you memorize and engineering is how well can you take things and apply them? And yes. And, and it seems like that, that, that trend follows you very well. So you graduate college and you join the field of engineering. Um, and it might've been a little bit of a blow to you. So like you go through this whole college course and you think you're going to be working on machines and all these things. Wh what ended up happening after college? I don't think I really even knew what I was going to be doing. I was just like, Oh my God, I need a job. I remember I got out of school and I was like, finally evaluating like how much debt am I in? Okay. It's not terrible. It was like 33 grand, I think was the number, which isn't horrible. It could have been way worse. I had way worse. Yeah. so much worse shape. So I was like, gone okay, to medical okay. School. yeah. And I was like, don't panic. <laughs> Yeah, I know exactly. My, my poor <laughs> sister. I, I say my poor sister while she's making like a billion dollars a year. And I'm like, oh, oh yeah. Uh, but anyway, she, yeah, holy shit. That was a lot of debt. Um, but yeah, so I, I got out and I got a job and I kind of drank the Kool-Aid. Well, I, all right. So here's the thing. I'm like the most suspicious person in the world in terms of like, I'm suspicious of, uh, so I, you'll never find me joining a cult or like some creepy religion or whatever, because I'm like, oh, you're all full of shit. Like yeah. whatever but I you'd hear, be a good, you'd be a good cult leader though. That's how oh, you know. I, could, I think <laughs> Creed said, I think, I think Creed from the office said it's uh it's more fun as a follower, <laughs> but, it, but I think you do better as a leader. Yeah, it's true. And, and, and so I think, um, you know, I, I, I really, I, like, you know, I did this whole leadership thing where it was like a two year rotational program and you got to drink the Kool-Aid. And I felt like I was infiltrating like a cult. Like I was going in and, you know, just, I was singing the praises of the company and doing the whole thing and, and, and do it. You know, I did my job, but I moved to South Carolina. I became a uh, process engineer in a printing plant. We made Duracell battery labels on these massive printing presses. Like, I mean, you know, when you see like an old timey newspaper press, yep. like these, but bigger, like they were whole like big factories. HP, big HP, like enterprise, just massive, yeah. massive, massive. Um, like six color presses. And uh, so my job was to like make them run faster. But I was in a relationship in Boston, living in South Carolina. So I and I was a head over heels, dumb, dumb 22 year old. All I wanted to do was go home and be, be with Mahani. And um, so I was like, I got to get home. I got to get home. So I, the only way to get home in this company was to join what they called a platform team because it was a global company that also made all the labels that are in your clothing. So when it says made in Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, Vietnam, China, Honduras, El Salvador, Turkey, Germany, wherever, that's where I had to go. The home base was an office in Boston. So I could go to Boston, live there, but the catch was I had to travel. And I was like, fine, I'll do anything. I want to go home. So I got home. And then the second I moved home, I was on a plane to Indonesia. I spent a week in Jakarta. Then I went straight to Bangladesh, spent a week in Bangladesh, went home, went back out, did two weeks in China, back home, two weeks in Vietnam. And I just flew. I mean, I would do 200,000 miles a year for like five years. Um, and I, I just lived all over the world. So, so question. So we, and we talk about this, like kind of, and we, we talked about it before we got on here, there's kind of this means that gets to it. So at some point there has to be this like ramp up where you're saying, actually, this is kind of getting me where I want to go. So was there a point where you're like, actually, this is working out? 
And this is maybe yeah, so, the course I'm going to stick with. So these guys, th- this team, this was like the real team. This was like breaking through Scientology and getting to like the level where everyone knows that it's bullshit, but we're in power. You know, it was like we were in a oh, I like this. Got, and they were like, it was like, holy shit, this is it. Like, we don't play by the fucking rules. Like, we, I, I'm not joking. Like, I would go in. This guy's dead. He was my favorite coworker. This guy, Ian Young. He was British, 55 Barfing. years old, and bald. And he had a pencil behind his ear at all times. And I never asked mechanical him about Mechanical number these. two. Mechanical or number two? Oh, number two. Very small. Very short. Okay. He sharpened the shit out of it. Got it. And he had little prison tattoos all over. Like he made these tattoos. I never asked because even though I worked with him and was like his brother for like five years, I was still afraid to ask about those tattoos. <laughs> and we would bust into factories all over the world and play good cop, bad cop. He would just tear shit off the walls. Like I would watch this guy throw just, it was like, it was like Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. I, that's the name of the movie, right? The yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. I watched this guy just tear people to the ground and then I'd be behind him going. So what Ian's trying to say is that your scrap rate's exceptionally high and we have an answer that's going to suit you. Here's what we're going to do. And so now they're broken and I'd walk in and show them how they're going to fix it. That's fantastic. And, it was unbel- and we would do this in Bangladesh. We do this in China. We would do this in Honduras. We would do this in Mexico. And it was just un- unbelievable. Life experience wise, life experience wise, you got to put that up there because you just can't get that. No, I, 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 it was, it was the kind of thing where like, I just no, you couldn't do that. This wasn't that long ago, but even today I'm like, Oh, we'd be so canceled. Like if anyone filmed what we did, like we, (laughs) I'm like, this is so bad, (laughs) Um, but it was great. And like, we got to, I mean, you just get addicted to the travel because what, instead of the way we talked about before we started recording, we were talking about like how you maybe, comp- you know, you feel like hot shit because you're like getting a promotion in your job, even though you made like $2,000 more a year and it really makes no impact in your life. Um, we would be like, oh, you're a baby traveler. You, it's April and you haven't flown 100,000 miles yet. And so like we would be on the road, like nonstop, just trying to get those points. Like how many, how many Hilton points do you get? How many intercontinental yeah. points do you get? Like, you know, it was just, that was our life. And it didn't matter about the money. We were just like, working to have this bizarre status. It was so stupid. Um, and eventually that, you know, we did enough of a good job to like bring all the scrap rates down and save the money that like we couldn't save any more money or not enough. So we kind of worked ourselves out into layoffs basically. Yeah. Yeah. And then that was, that. you were too efficient. Happens. Yeah. All we were good at our jobs. <laughs> we were good at our jobs. Um, and then I kind of fell into like, a project management job and then a program management job, which was my last, my last career choice. I want to ask you, I want to pull back real quick before you go into the project and program. So a lot of people see being laid off as like really, a a really terrible thing, which it is in most cases, but it seems like this one, you kind of made the best of what you were doing. There was no more running rate for where you to go. So what was the kind of best lesson you learned from being laid off? Um, I realized that, um, a, your job is never safe. Um, and so people like to, people like to make this assumption that because you're in a corporate atmosphere that you're safe, that like, Oh, that's the smart choice because you're a company man. You've got this 401k, you've got all this stuff. But the reality is as an independent contractor or a freelancer, you're just as vulnerable to being fired or laid off as you are in a company. Because the reality is the company is not there for you. You are there for the company. And I think a lot of people think that if they're loyal to their masters, they will, they will do well. And in certain circumstances, it keeps them chugging along. And if you do a really good job, you might get through. But all it takes is for the company to do just bad enough and for the board and the C-suite executives to not want to give up their bonuses to require a consulting group, the Bobs, if you will, to come in yep. and slash everyone yeah. to the ground. And and that's the thing is we, we like to think that if you play by the rules and you're a nice guy and everything works out good and you hit your targets, that you'll be fine. That is absolutely false. It is just absolutely false. You are more likely to succeed if you do that, but you are not, it, it does not prevent you from getting laid off. Absolutely not. Yeah. Great, great <laughs> reference to the bobs and also great reference, to, great reference to the meme of the guy slowly putting on clown makeup. Like if I just work harder and cheer everybody up, I'll be there. Yeah. And, and I want to be, I don't want to be a buzzkill, but I think people, it, it's a psychological thing that everybody thinks like, well, if I do this, I'll be safe. But it's like, you're not, I mean, like you just not. No, no, for yeah. sure. And, and so many people, um, push, I mean, push their family members or kids to go corporate because that exact reason you said, oh, you should, you should join that company because they've got great benefits. 
you know, I'm working over here. They don't, you know, I work for myself. I don't have, I got to pay for all that. They pay for that. No, it, but in reality, you end up paying for your own benefits. Like I pay a lot of money every month for my benefits and it comes out of my pocket. And like, you know, you, you do all these things to go be the company man, but you're never safe. You're and the one, way companies one bad are trying day to, being fired. Absolutely. And the way companies try to manipulate people into believing that like, all right. So the one thing that I noticed in my last job was that they, they started changing the names to sound more like, cute or more like for the people. So like our HR person, the VP of HR became the VP of people. Bro. Okay. Wow. Experience. Right. They're and, and that's yeah. Real progressive. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and then, and then they would start putting things on the walls. Like, you know, that you walk in on a Tuesday and the, and the TVs would all say like, it's gratitude. You should be grateful. Now what they aren't saying is do we're like grateful that. for you. What they're saying is you should be fucking grateful that you have this job. Yeah. Is what they were saying. So, I'm like, you know, you're really flipping this the wrong direction because I'm walking in and, and I hate looking at every single one of you. And yet you're telling me to be grateful and you treat me like shit. And you're telling me to be grateful. I think you should be a little grateful that I'm coming in on time every day. Like that's, that's the gratitude that I would appreciate on gratitude Tuesday and not the other way around. And so that this is the, this is the scam that most corporate jobs are like trying to, or like hip corporate jobs are kind of pulling on their employees right now is where they're telling you, even though, you know, Hey guys, this was a rough year and we're not going to be doing merit raises this year. And your bonuses, you're only going to be getting 10% of them. Also, your healthcare is going to go up by about 5% and we're not changing anything in the benefits. Um, so yeah, uh, but we're not laying anybody off. So you should be grateful. And <laughs> at the same time, I'm watching when they have the meetings, by the way, everyone should be looking in the parking lot. This is why you need to be a car person in any capacity. It's good because point. usually a, a week or two before these types of decisions are made, the board and the C-suite gets together because they're going to have these meetings. Now, if they're not doing it at an expensive retreat where they're flying private to Aspen to figure this out, what they are doing is they're doing it at your headquarters. And so when you notice that there's a bunch of Ferraris, Porsches, and Aston Martins in the, in the, in the parking lot, that's when they're deciding not to give you a merit raise. Well, th- how are that's they going to afford their next car? Or exactly. Car? Yeah. yeah and like, so that's about the time when I'm like, you know what? It's time to get out. <laughs> well, the, the insurance alone, I mean, come on, unless you yeah. set up an LLC in Montana, let's say, yeah. you know, for those cars, it's going to be very expensive. Now, I do have a question, though, because this is actually a very, this is a, um, this is a huge pivot point that we see a lot. And there's two things that I want to touch on going into this. One, the experience that you gained there. This will be, uh, let's just start with this. The experience that you gained going through all of that. And this goes out to kind of what we strive to do about telling people about YouTube, how to start a YouTube channel, what it takes to kind of get through this grit and kind of understand what to do. Like how much of going through that experience has made you successful in your platform today and made that decision, the decision that you knew was the right choice? Probably everything. So I, 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 to be exaggerating, you know, you can treat it like red pill, blue pill in the matrix, because if you work at a company and you don't look up to anybody above you, none of them are a role model. None of them have a life that you desire or envy other than maybe a CEO who just has some great shit, but like, look, look two levels above you, look at a director or a VP um, or, or a manager or whatever. If none of them look like somebody that you just crave to have their day, to have their life, to have their family, to have their properties, whatever, uh, then what the fuck are you working for? Because that's where you're going. If you keep going up, there's that, that's it. You're looking at your future. And so I go into these companies, I'd look a few rungs up the ladder and I see like four divorces um, miserable people who are just counting down the days to their retirement. And I'm like, well, like how dumb am I? Of course I'm on the same path. Like, why do I think I'm going to be any different than this guy? So, uh, this isn't for me. So I finally got to a point where every day was just as psychologically torment. Like I was depressed. I was, I don't think angry was the right word. I was just so stressed out. I was defeated and stressed out. Like my, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wish I could say I was cool. Like, um, the guy in office space who just like knocks down his walls and stops caring. But the problem was I cared. I cared 
so much because I still wanted to do well because I'm a people pleaser. Like I still wanted to do my job, and get things done. And I didn't want to disappoint my teams. And the, I, I realized like when my, my neck and my back were just, I literally, I, I could barely move. I was so stressed out. I was in pain and it was just heaping on more and more and more. Um, and I realized that there was no way out. I was like, this is bad. Um, and I, and I had saved money as my nervous breakdown fund to be like, I get to leave. And I think this is the shot and my NBA yeah. channel nervous breakdown fund. Absolutely. And I think it was because, so I had very recently, like maybe a few months prior to this, um, somebody had recommended me to do some film and like, yeah, just videography for a local Aston Martin dealership. And I was like, Oh, sure. And I'm like, Oh, I, I guess I need to make a price list. So I started like, figuring out like how much would I charge for these things? And I was like, wow, like if I do this and if the YouTube channel earns like, you know, a few hundred dollars here and there, um, I could pay my rent and my credit card bill. Like right. that's kind of, that's kind of insane. Like, holy shit. I have, Oh my God, I have a side gig. I did. How did I fall into a side gig? And then once I realized that like there was enough money to be net zero, I could just keep myself afloat without burning my savings. That's when I was like, I got to quit now. I got to do this now. This is the time. And I did. I, I, I put in my two weeks. Um, and then a month later, the pandemic hit hard. And I should have just waited. A, well, no, I, I don't think I could have survived another month. But if I waited another month, I would have been able to raise my hand and elect to be laid off, which I would have collected a severance for a few months. Um, so I didn't. Uh, unfortunately, I missed the boat on that. But the reality was I, I, I relinquished myself of the stress and I walked away. Yeah. And that's, and that's great. And, and this is the other piece that we taught. This is like, now, how does the other, you know, it's like, well, that's the other, the other shoes dropped. And now you are talking to this about your family, whoever's in your life. Um, what were those conversations like? Were they taken as in like, yep, you're passionate about it, go for it. Or was it more of a, what are you doing? My mom was like, quit your job today. <laughs> that's Run. awesome done. You're you, cause I would talk to her every day, like during lunch. And she was like, you sound more and more like I'm scared. Like you need to get out. Like you need yeah. to not do like, you don't need this. You can live a happier life with less money. You could live a happier life. Just, you cannot go to this place anymore. This place is not good for you. Um, yeah. and that was a deal. Like, look, I'm not saying like, this is the answer. I'm just saying for me, it absolutely was like, there are people and I envy these people. I envy people who can go to school every day and get all their work done on time and get the straight A's and go to their company job and, 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 you know, please their boss and do all the things. But like Chris Amos said it the best and he made it. Okay. Chris goes, cause Chris is Chris, the Topher. He's, he's a, you know, he's, he's never worked a day in his life for anybody else. He's always been a freelance photographer and videographer and all this stuff. And he told me straight up, he goes, you know what, Tom, I'm not a team player and neither are you. And <laughs> when I I had been indoctrinated for the last 10 years of leadership training and all this shit, you're a team player. And I was like, fuck, I'm not a team player. I fucking hate this team. <laughs> and once I like felt like it was okay to say it, because the thing is, everything we see is always telling you to like, really everything is just trying to make, put you on your knees in front of a leader, right? Like that's be a leader, be a leader, but in the process, somehow you're following somebody. It's insane. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And, and that's when I was like, Oh, I, I can, I can walk away from this and I can just do my, own. I can try. And at least I'll try. Yeah. yeah. The biggest cult in America is corporate America, but, uh, it, you're, you're, we're just sheep going to pay someone else's bills. I, I no. couldn't agree more. So, um, you leave your job on your own and you go full time on YouTube, but your relationship with YouTube didn't start as the Ted word you are today. And as the person you are today, it was more so an archive. Um, and I think there's a great story there, right? So why did you start? Well, first off, when, when was your first memory of using YouTube? And then why did you start to upload videos there? And it looked like it was just clips that then changed yeah. to making videos that then changed to making videos about something you love. Can you talk about that process too? Yeah. So YouTube to me, I did not know YouTube was like a person could make a vlog. Like that didn't, that did not exist in my mind. I had no idea. Like when I first started using YouTube, it was purely to find out do I want to buy a 350 Z in 2007? Like that, that was it. <laughs> yeah. It was like, it was like, Holy shit. That thing sounds incredible. 
And then it was like, which exhaust do I want to put on my 350Z in 2008? Like that's, yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, that was, that was it. That was like, how, what, what exhaust sounds good on a car is the only thing YouTube was to me because we had just evolved from streetfire.net, which was the only way to find cars on the internet pre YouTube. We used streetfire.net for everything. That was how you saw street races. You could find out if an M6 was faster than an E55. That was it. That's how it worked. Yeah. Um, and that's all it was. It was like these little clips. And then my, so my relationship to YouTube changed a lot uh, because I would upload little clips here and there. They oddly enough, kind of some of the clips resemble a vlog. Like I'm doing the thing. Like I'm yeah. talking to a camera, like at the top of a road in a mountain being like, we just drove up here. Who, who, who are you people? Like, it's so weird that I'm talking like this. Um, but it was just like a natural thing to do that. So uh, but what really started me picking up a camera and genuinely using it and not just posting like a clip of my dog playing ball on the stairs, um, which is was, the first video on your channel. Yeah. It was yeah. Actually really entertaining. Yeah. Charlie. Yeah. She's great. Cause she would drop the ball down the stairs and then wait for you to throw it to her. Cause she was <laughs> such a smart little asshole that she made us play fetch. So that was the, <laughs> that was the thing. Two and a half, two and a half thousand views on that. I know that's <laughs> it's funny. Cause it's all people doing exactly what you did going. I wonder yep. what this jerks first. Video is. Well, and, <laughs> no, no, it, it's actually, it resembles like a TikTok video or like an Instagram reel, but it was like a decade before that existed. Like absolutely it's pretty cool. You, 2006. Trend, let's call it like a trendsetter. The original TikTok <laughs> right here. Yeah. That's actually, they probably <laughs> stole that from you. So yeah. you might be should go. Should go. Yeah. yeah. Those bastards. <laughs> but like I so I really I started actually picking up a camera because so I had a friend, my my best friend in the world, Anton. Um, he would film everything. So like we'd go, you know, we're in college, we're drunk in a grocery store. You bet his Blackberry was out filming it and putting it on YouTube. Uh all these dumb things he was doing in his cars. He'd run out and put a camera on the side of the road and drive his eighth gen Honda Civic SI up and down this road like nine times just to get the exhaust sound and know what it would sound like. Um, and so he had all these great clips and he was in a lot of them because he'd bring the camera inside. He'd go to a track day and bring the cameras, all that stuff. Um, but then he died. He took his own life in 2015. And I was, I was wrecked. Like this was, this was my, you know, I'm at the wake just to give you like, I remember going up to, I, I was in Hong Kong when he did it. I flew straight home. I go up to his mother, not knowing if she was going to be mad at me because like we had gone through a lot with other suicide attempts and she just hugged me and said, you were his soulmate. And I was like, Oh my God, like this was my person. And he's gone. I talked to him every single day for six years. He was like my formative college friend and he was gone, but he had taken all these videos and for a while, I was going through like very clear stages of grief where like I was in complete denial. I was hunting for things that were like going to bring him back or something. But I would watch his videos and I could hear his voice. I could hear him laugh. I could watch him move. And it was like, oh, my God, like nobody has this. This is the most 2015 thing. Like a person died and I can still like kind of experience them. And so then I started getting in my natural fashion, very paranoid. Uh, and I was like, well, I mean, he can't be the only one, like I'm going to lose my other friends. So somewhat morbidly, I started picking up cameras and when we'd have parties, I'd film my friends and I'd be like, oh, like, oh, we're moving a couch. We're having this dinner. We're drunk together. We're doing this. We're doing that. And I started filming everybody because I'm just like, well, we need an archive of everybody. Like I, I want this of everybody. Um, and then the, you know, my grief started waning and I was able to kind of get through some stuff. And, but I was addicted to this posting. I'm like, I have to post every week. And so I'd be posting a video and it, it's just, I mean, they're just obscure vlogs, you know, I'd like going on a date, you know, I dated a chef, he'd make a cake. So I'd, I'd film the cake, you know? Um, and then it was like, well, I'm watching Shmi and Seb Delaney and these guys do this stuff. I'm like, well, I'm not in Monaco, but I got a few cars. Why not film my cars? <laughs> and it didn't take off. Like, I never was like, oh my God, this is going to work. I did a video when I got laid off from that first job. I did a series going across the country in this Miata. We did a road trip in this like piece of shit Miata, like a $1,400 straight pipe, just like five different colors. <laughs> and, and like, we had a blast and we made like a vlog out of it. There's like five or six episodes. And I'm like, it actually holds up. Like we've watched it a few times and I'm like, I am proud of this because I was making it while I was posting them on the road. Like we were making them editing them and posting them on the trip in real time. 
Um, and I don't know how I did that to be honest with you, but I just kind of, I just was like, okay, Seb Delaney and Shmi both use these Sony handy cams, get those, uh, and, and just do the thing, like figure it out, edit it, make, make some art that makes you happy. And people kind of latched onto that a little bit, but it wasn't until I started really going deep on the POV stuff. And I was like dedicating time to it when I was like, you know what, you got to just go volume and you have access to the craziest shit on the planet. Just film the crazy stuff and put it up there and show people what it's like to drive a Fizzarini or a Ferrari Dino or a, a Testarossa or whatever. Just put them up there. And that's when it started. That's when it really hit. And so yeah. you have that realization, right? And, and at that point, when you're like, I'm going to put up the Testarossa video and I'm going to start to do these kind of things. I don't even know the cars you said before that it was the only one I knew. So <laughs> not a car guy, uh, <laughs> but so you put up these, these videos and, and so where, where does it start to, how many subscribers did you have at that moment? Probably 30,000 maybe. Okay. So you had, a, you had a decent channel there at that point, especially from where you were doing vlogs and things like that. Um, now you're at 202,000 and growing. And so, what was it like you make that change? How many days, how many months, how many years was it before you started to see the return on that investment, that change? It was quick. It was like shockingly quick, actually. Um, there were a few videos that hit really hard at the same time. And there was some snowball effect there. And now I feel like a complete idiot because I'm trying to remember which video did it. Um, there was a video. And this is like, makes me look at the worst YouTuber where I'm like, I don't even remember the thing that did it. Um, but there was a couple of videos that just hit really, really hard that blew up. And it went from like, it went from like 30,000 to a hundred thousand in a hurry. Like, I think it, you know, yeah, it was like, were they big cars or was it like more of like the about like the M5 or, or anything like that? No, the, ah, man. Was that that you have, you have some other ones that like how to use DCT and things like that, that like yeah. a lot of people don't I mean, know when they go to look at the 92. How about you know Val, I mean? MW 335i? Yeah. I need to look at like what this is. And let me see. I feel so yeah. stupid that I can't remember. No, don't, don't feel stupid because this. This, <laughs> this, is this is a super deep question on what we're trying to do. But I'm trying, what, what, I'd like, what I'd like to do, and we talked about this before, is like, I want to sit, like, show people that starting a YouTube channel based on either the archive methodology, because Mowgli um, did the same thing. He's a skateboarder. He, he opened my eyes to that. And then, like, you get started here and you start to learn, like, oh, maybe I can transition my channel. So, even if you start your channel today, you're not stuck in the thought process of like, I have to do this. Yeah. yeah. Well, the Hurricane so, Performante uh, drifting in the snowstorm. I mean, that one blew up pretty big and your yeah, buddy crashed right. and your buddy crashing his Audi into the snowbank was also pretty funny. Yeah. So, I, so that wasn't our buddy. We don't know who that is. I still, to this day, have no idea who that was. No way. Oh, and by the way, that's some of the worst all wheel drive driving in the world. When he goes in, when he it was, just doesn't, it was, when he doesn't power back into the turn is my favorite yeah. part. And he goes straight into the bank. I go, Oh, what an idiot. Yeah, actually. All right. So if we, if we cut there and came back, let's pretend we came back. So like, yeah. I, I don't, I, so the, the Lamborghini video was the gift that kept on giving because that was a, a phone call that got made to me. My friend, um, Safi, he was like, Hey, it's the day because the snow hit just right. And like, we were all working from home and this is like a long, this is a long time ago. And so we were like, let's do it. So we went out and we snowboarded. The idea was to snowboard behind the car and just film like almost a very Stradman Casey Neistat style video. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I put it together quick and I remember coming home and I said, this is going to be my first million of view video. I said that to my roommate and he can vouch for this. And then I put it up and it, almost did nothing. Like it went to like 20,000 views. And I remember being like, I mean, for me that at the time was big, but I was like, Oh no, like this was supposed to be huge. And it wasn't. Yeah. And then a ton of like vlog, like blogs picked it up. Like it was like a motor one auto blog, gelatinic kind of thing. And like a bunch of those guys mm -hmm. kind of picked it up and then it just exploded and every, and I'm curious every winter since it's done like a million views. So it's at 6 million right now. I'm very curious to see if this year is still going to do it. Cause it's always been a great way to buy all my Christmas gifts. Cause it's like, you know, that that's, that's Christmas money right there. Um, <laughs> sure. And that's that, crazy. But the, but the big flaw in that video was that it's not what I was producing. Like it was not, it was a one-off. And so I gained all these subscribers. And then I think they were all just like, well, this guy sucks. Cause he's not, you're like, this is this. what I make. 
Yeah. yeah it, it, it was like, I might as well have had a cooking show and then this tempered <laughs> it, you know? So I think I've like done, you have everybody. cooking, you have cooking stuff on your YouTube. I know I have done this. So I think I just was like, this just didn't add up. And anyway, so I gained a ton of subscribers. It was good, consistent money, I guess. But at the same time, it was like, whatever. But it wasn't until I like, I realized that I had to make my channel into like a TV show in the sense that and not, not a TV show that like it's fake or whatever. I needed to make it so every time you turn on Friends or Seinfeld, you are greeted with the same formula every yeah. single time. You never, yeah. you never turn on Friends and it's a David Lynch presents Friends. It's not some creepy right. blue velvet shit. Like it's it's Friends. You you know what you're in for. You start here, you end there. It's funny there and there and there and it's done. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna have an intro a style, a formula, a strategy, go. And that's what I did. I just kind of developed it. And like, I'm still developing it. But now that I have like a following and it's set in stone a little bit, I'm like terrified to change it. I'm like, I think I can improve it. But I'm also like, should I? Yeah, you, you know, it's you like Brandon style guide for yourself. But right. You know, yeah. well, you should be a little nervous because uh, the M, I just watched a video from Donut today. The M3 broke out of BMW style style guide the new one with the long video yeah, and bad. people hate it <laughs> but it's bad it's really yeah. bad i've got a i've got a great i got a great photoshop that i made myself that is that i suppose on reddit all the time to troll people and it'd be like the it would be the the new you know back then i think it was like the new 2019 bmw and it was just a barbecue that i replaced the bmw <laughs> emblem on the front of the weber and it was like <laughs> just a grip just an actual grill and i thought that was the best thing in the world <laughs> I can appreciate that. No, but that's, and you know what it was like, if I look back on that, like the summer that I really took this to be like my full-time job, I was just hunting down everything I could. And I got lucky because I, I met up with people with crazy collections. And I had a guy who, uh, a friend of mine who became a friend of mine, did not know me, had never met me. I didn't even meet him when I drove his cars. He had other guys who were at the property. Like, here's, here's the SL 65 black series. Here's this, here's that. And like, you know, here's the Unimog. And I'm like, okay. And, and I just did it. And then they saw the videos. They were like, oh, we love this. Take whatever you want, whenever you want it. This oh, is what's crazy. so important. And I want to talk about it all the time. And a, cause I'll watch that S 65 black series all day. Because when you talked about, Hey, you know, earlier before we talked, say, Hey, I want to present cars that you're not going to see every day or that aren't recorded on all the time. That's one of them. Also just ripping the S 65, that just wagon that's just below the Maybach, but is a supercar essentially. Like those are <laughs> hilariously great vids. And if you look at like legit street cars, he's redoing an SL 65 from the ground up right now, which is incredible. Um, but these partnerships are so key in channels like yours and car reviewers and yours in particular, where you've got a couple of dealerships and you've got a couple of friends, but like you started out sitting side by side and some of those people would be filming you doing it. And now you're just rolling solo. The trust level is there. So like, how do you build those partnerships and how important were they to building your channel? They're everything. I mean, absolutely everything. And I think so. The, one of the biggest partnerships that I have is with um, Bond Group, which at the time when I started with them was Aston Martin New England. And then they sold the franchise, which terrified me because I thought, oh no, you know, Steve Serio, who you'll hear on Smoking Tire podcast, like he, he ran that operation. And I thought, oh no, like this is the gravy train gone. Like my access to some of these crazy cars is going to be over because while, yes, he was running an Aston Martin dealership, he is like, the car, like the guy, he's the car broker. Like he gets the craziest shit in the country at this place. And I thought, well, what if this all goes away? And it turns out it was just the opposite. All we did was dump all these new Aston Martins that, which by the way, you want to tank a channel film Aston Martins. Oh my God. Why you <laughs> like, did the, you did the, you did the, uh, the convertible V12 of, a, uh, uh, the Virage okay. I've done. Vir Virage? I've, driven, I've driven literally everything and, and nobody cares uh, but there's no until you hear one go past you and you're like oh never mind unless they do Ho not get clicks tyler hoover can get them clicks because he does it the other way where it's here's why you don't want to buy this car because i bought it and it's a shit show i've driven every v variety of virage and rapide and vanquish yeah, and just, i've yeah. driven i've driven the what's the db7 one the uh dbar1 zagato convertible yep. i've driven i mean literally like you name it i've, I've driven a i driven a fucking db4 series 5 the james bond car 
because yeah. the reality is all the shots of the James Bond car and Goldfinger, all the driving shots were, that wasn't a DB five. It was a DB four series five. Right. And that's like, I mean, like I, I spent like a lot of time in that car. That's if you think it's a US thing, I'd be curious to look at your like geographic spread of like who your viewers are, because I, I feel like maybe you're just, maybe that's just the US, but I don't know. Assens are special. I love a good review of an Assen. So I'm I'm definitely gonna be one of those clicks on your channel. Um, but what maybe you don't but, get it elsewhere, but I mean, but like driving a new DBS Super Legera or a, a DB11 or a Vantage, like you just don't get the views. Like those are not heavy hitters on, 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 for me at least. Like every time I have to film an Aston, I'm like, oh God, like it's, it's like not worth the time. Um, uh, yeah. Well, which brings me to the next point. And I want to bring this up. And this is a pretty serious topic. Um, the amount of absolute hate for the wheels on that LFA that you <laughs> were mind blowing. I mean, the amount of trash that people gave to like, how could you do that to an LFA? What are those wheels? It's, like, I think I even, I think I even trashed them. And I was like, great review, terrible wheels. You know what I mean? It's possible that those wheels are the reason that video has so much engagement, which like, it's, it's you couldn't it. help but comment. It was unbelievable, which is funny because when you see the car in person, it's like pretty good. It like works. Um, yeah. And, but I get it. I remember the first time I saw it, I was like, okay. Okay. And then, and then I was like, all right, maybe this isn't that bad. And now I like totally appreciate it because I'm like, this is the most easily identifiable LFA in the world, which I think is really funny though, because it's, <laughs> it's one thing when people say like, oh, those wheels are he heinous. I'm like, okay, that's fine. That's your opinion. That's great. What's crazy is when someone says you ruined a good LFA, like by putting underglow and wheels on, it. I'm like, you know, those are both like the most removable mods in the world. Yeah. Like, it's like, you know, I mean, it's basically sticky tape. You don't even need a, well, that's what it is. You need a lift or any like real tool. You could use the tools technically in the back of the car to remove both of those devices. I mean, I can legitimately say <laughs> that those wheels are there to preserve the original wheels. Like the original wheels aren't like Genius. sold. They're like in a fucking refrigerator somewhere, you know, yeah. like, well, yeah. And that, that car, literal ice, <laughs> that car is like, go back to the partnerships and what you get to drive because what, what uh, I think one just sold on bring a trip for 700,000 it's like kind of right oh. in that mark but like the yeah. access to these cars is unbelievable and that's why I was like man the trust these folks put in you like you have to put in some serious report it's not like you're it's not like just a, some of the guys like hey do you mind if I drive your car right well and that LFA by the way like I mean the owner hadn't even seen it yet like it it arrived to it arrived in Massachusetts off a truck and I wasn't supposed to film it the day I filmed it. Um, I took a picture of it because it was at uh, Garage 42, which is where I keep my cars. Uh, it's my yeah. friend's like storage facility. Yeah. I took a picture of it. And then the owner called me and he goes, hey, if you're there, just take it. And he hadn't even seen the car yet. He had not seen the car. And so I was like, oh, okay. And then I was like, should I do this? I'm like, fuck it, go, just do it. And I, I put on my camera and I went. So that was a completely on the fly, not researched video that was like me just being like i hope you remembered a bunch of shit and then i went for it um, <laughs> and then that Which was for the that. lfa i guess most you kind of you remember some of it but there's also those weird quirks of there's like uh what is it the parking brake or reverse or something like that that's like there's a couple weird quirks in those cars that you're like mm, how do i do that again but also, what's funny is that be keep in mind that uh this is seven hundred thousand dollars so don't screw it up yeah. I try not to think about the money. I mean, I retreat every car with respect. So it's never like a thing where it, like, you know, right. e even if you handed me like a, a $2,000 Accord, I'm going to drive it, you know, I'm not going to crash it. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. It's going to be okay. Um, but I think what happens is like a lot of, a lot of these cars, like I've driven pretty much every power level of car you can get within reason, like right. aside from like, you know, twin turbo Vipers and Gallardos and stuff. Like I'm not like a Texas 2K guy yet. We'll get there someday maybe. But like for the most part, most of the people whose cars I drive, they see what I've driven and they're like, I mean, he's not going to crash this. <laughs> yeah. Know? I want to, I want to pull back to the brand and style that you were talking about. So like you, you're, you're driving all these cars, like, obviously respectfully and, and, and through a different lens though, right. You're driving them from a POV, which is much different than most YouTubers out there who are driving it with the camera in front of them. And your channel is really just your hands and your voice and the sound of the car and the true experience. How did you land on that being the style you wanted to portray? And where did the idea come from? 
So there's two reasons. Um, number one was that when you're not famous, your face doesn't mean shit. So I wasn't very, famous. Very point. I wanted I wanted to be famous, but nobody fucking cares about another goddamn face in another goddamn car blabbing at you and pretending to act. And I realized that when a camera was facing me, this is the second point. So number one, nobody wants to see me because who the hell is this guy? And second of all, I realized that I talked way more naturally when I wasn't facing the camera. Right. When the camera was facing away from me, I was having a conversation with my audience with as if there was one person in the car. I'm just talking to that person. And that's what I did. I said, I'm talking to one person. Maybe there's a million views on the video, but I'm talking to one person because everyone's viewing the individually. Yeah. So I, it was really those two things. It's because I'm like, well, nobody cares who, for example, every kid or every person who wants to be a YouTuber, they want to be a vlogger. Well, you have to add value before you can be a vlogger. You have to be someone before anyone gives a shit how you wake up. Okay. Nobody cares about Joe Schmo's morning routine, but I would watch Will Smith eat fucking potato chips. Okay. Like I couldn't he agree added more. Value. Um, yeah, he added value. I would do that. No, hundred percent. And that, that's a great fact because you're, you're, you're kind of boiling down the reality of what it is. Find your medium, build the audience. Then they want to know who you are, but you right. have to, you have to create that value proposition in the beginning. You have to be important. Like for example, every uh, Steve Jobs. If Steve Jobs was not, and I, I hate using him as an example, but I'm going to. <laughs> if, if Steve Jobs was not the CEO of Apple, if he did not like found a company that changed everything, but he was just a quirky, weird individual talking to a camera, you would not watch him. You would not care. But because he added value to your life, you're like, what kind of turtleneck does he wear? What percentage of cotton was it? Like, <laughs> that's all. Yes, that's the thing. <laughs> if you're famous enough, they fucking care what percentage of cotton you wear. Okay? Yeah, yeah. But you which I like. It better be value. bamboo. Better be bamboo, yes. buddy. But but you know one the one thing about Steve Jobs and his turtleneck that you can probably testify to is at least you know where the label came from and it <laughs> yeah. came probably from you right you know exactly where that came from so absolutely but that's great so it, well it's another thing and and you talk about adding value and as car people as uh, as I as I include myself in the community because I'm just a, a fanatic I have a problem where my fiance said when you look at cars you just see data that like scrolls in front of your eyes and I was like a little <laughs> bit it's kind of like that it's a little bit like data scrolling in front of my eyes but I'm such like I'm such an enthusiast and I love seeing cars and I love seeing reviews and a lot of times what we want to see or what we miss is the experience and what you bring in is something that it's not totally unique, but it is at the same time. And it's, a, it's the binaural audio that you yep. bring and what you bring into the show and, and, and what every single car, it's like every sound click door shut door open shift, everything. You can hear it all. So when you talk about adding value, like how important is that? And, and what was that like getting that started? What I guess got you started on the binaural audio path of saying, like, I'm going to give an immersive experience and make sure that like, hey, A, people are wearing headphones and listen to this appropriately. And then I want people to be really involved with this drive. Yeah. So Chris Amos is the one who really pioneered binaural audio. And we were using it in Wine and Bread magazine, which I was filming six to seven videos a month for for a few years. Um, once I was basically making more money off of my own videos, then it was like, okay, I, I need... It's adding more value not to film for them. So I probably will pepper in some videos with them once in a while just to like stay current and like be on the channel once in a while. Um, but you know, he really pioneered that. And the thing was, I, 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 there's still no good mic setup in a car. Other than this, I, I swear to God, like a shotgun mic does not do anything justice. It records a voice and then it'll blow out all the other audio. Um, of course, it's and, doing its purpose. And, and, right? and because you look like a you... directional mic that's 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 set up to to hit the human voice, not the tones of a car. And exactly. you look like and no offense, but you look like a fucking lunatic when you're driving around the roads. Yeah, and you I do like it all it. for the users. I do it for myself. I do it for them. But the reason... So here's the other thing is I had to become realistic about some things. So I'm a one-man band. Okay. It is just me. And I want to put out... Like, this is the thing. I want to put out three videos a week. I am not top gear. I do not have a crew. I don't have a Range Rover follow a car. I don't have any money to pay anybody to be in another car with another camera and another mic and another monitoring system and a drone and all this shit. It is me. How do I, little me, create three videos a week that are worth watching? And the reality was, keep it fucking simple. 
Yeah. Okay. Simple, simple, simple. I use two cameras. At first I used one. I was just using my GoPro. Then I picked up my A7S III and I used that for my like sexy B-roll walk around shots. Right. Um, but I use two cameras. I use my binaural microphones and that's the guilt. The, the game is just to show you a real immersive experience of driving a car that you could never have access to and an experience which you would not get from anyone else, including Top Gear. Because if you watch Top Gear, which of course we all love it. It's fun. They have incredible cinematography, but the reality is it is not reality. They do not show you what it is actually like to operate any of these vehicles. No, you get, and it's you scripted, get the, it's dubbed over. It's, it's to, it's to a, uh, an agenda. Sometimes let's talk about tests, yes. you know, tests on other things, but yeah, go ahead. And the idea that you could get into an LFA and it was going to be a realist, like this is what it looks like when you get into an LFA in your driveway and drive away in it. No one's shown that before. No, no you're no right. One's shown this, and that's what that's what hits the car guys. Because I remember sitting in my backyard in in Kirkland, Washington, right, and there was a big road that we had a fence, and it went up against the the road, and I would be sitting outside having a beer with JP, and literally by exhaust tones, he could tell exactly what car was going by. Oh, that's this, this. Uh, I would just be like, what the heck? But you hit it because that's exactly what car guys care about. It's like audiophiles having the argument of was real to real versus vinyl better for <laughs> true audio. No one actually cares unless it's those people and you're hitting a true audience where at the same time, you're getting these new people who might not care about how good the audio sounds or the, the exhaust notes, but they're looking at buying this car because it means something to them for somewhere. And they want to see actually how it's going to be like to drive it. Can I actually take my wife on a date in this car? Can I actually yeah. go do something? Can I drive a hundred miles or 200 miles to go do something in this car? Well, when I look at the review from X, Y, Z, you're not going to say any other brands. It, they don't care. They're not doing that. They're going to the specs. It's got this much horsepower. This, this is, it's not the actual experience. So you, you, and I also, I mean, I just got so bored watching a guy go like this today. We have a special car to drive. This is the new 2021. And I'm like, Oh my God, I don't know who you are. Stop talking to me. Like you're somebody, you know? And so I basically became a nobody so that way I could be somebody. That was it. The whole That's point great. was you don't have to look at me. Just look at the damn car. That, I love I that. Clip my nails. You're That's a mad. great way. You know. That's a great way to put it. I love that. All right. So the, the next question I have is a little controversial. Okay. Um, all right. So the name Tedward. How do you feel about voting? No. <laughs> <laughs> you should vote. Everybody should vote. I can uh, say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. Everybody? No. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a pulse, you should be voting. Yes. Um, so the name Tedward, according to Urban Dictionary, um, is someone who is named Theodore, but doesn't want to go by Edward. So they go by Ted and therefore is named it Tedward. Is that where the name of the channel came from? So my name, my first name is Tom. My middle name is Edward. So T. Edward is Tedward. And the only reason this became Tedward was because when I was starting to build the channel back in like 2016, I was having a conversation with my significant other. And I was like, what should we name the channel? I don't think I want my name on it. And he said, I, I don't know if he said it or I said it, or I, one of us said it. He might, you know, let's for the sake of a legal battle, let's say I said it. Um, and then, and then we, we both just laughed. Money. Yeah, we both just laughed. And I remember thinking, like, wouldn't that be the dumbest name in the world if I got famous and some guy came up to me at a car show and said, Oh my God, it's Tedward. And it was just a joke. Like, that was just a joke. And then we did it. And then I was like, Okay, I luckily he was, he helped me with the logo. I did draw the logo because it's the it's the it's the unrestricted speed sign and then angle moved up and then a t at the same time so it's kind of okay. the, it's just that um but he he made it in photoshop for the first time and then i was like perfect i've got my logo that's it and we're done and then and then all my friends thought it was really stupid and then i like the <laughs> local car community were like oh that's a fucking ted word guy and yep. then they'd be mean to me and call me ted tard and all this other shit i'm like i don't care i'm like 27 like what the fuck do i care like go ahead and bully me like, yeah. like trust me with the life i've led i'm good like you can make fun of me all you want and then here we are years later and it fucking worked 
Yeah. And it's like and now people are calling you dadboard. Yeah. Well, and what's funny is like now people that know me, people that genuinely actually know me, affectionately refer to you as Tedward. And they'll go, Ted, I mean, Tom. Oh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> like, and they like forget my name. And I'm like, do you know how good your fucking branding has to be for someone you've known for 10 years to forget your name? I'm like, this is everything. <laughs> That's awesome. That's amazing. Cause I, I, I was just like stumbling through uh, like research and I was like, okay, this is a very obscure urban dictionary. Uh, that comes up when you Google your name. I'm like, if it has to do with this, this is the only, literally the only time in 60 plus episodes that I've used Urban Dictionary as a resource and screenshotted it to put it in here to get some context. So I'm glad that that we got that. There was no, there yeah. was a um, there was a college humor video called Tedward where he was like this unibrowed um, like it guy at work. And it was supposed to be like a joke, like just some like spoof skit thing. And so my greatest achievement was now, like if you type in Tedward, like that no longer shows up. Mm, there so you go. You pushed think, it out. I think I pushed out college humor. So, so your own, your own that's, SEO has just good. by organic, yeah. your organic traffic has pushed it out, which is nice. Yeah. So then, um, uh, yeah, JP, ahead, I think you, yeah. Uh, well, no, I, 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 I got something. Um, and, and this is important. I think it goes back to kind of just, your brand and your channel as a whole and kind of who you are and loving just cars and driving. And, you know, you, you do a lot of driving, um, especially when you're commuting, you know, to and from your old corporate job to now you're doing it for, you know, for a, uh, you know, for your actual living. Um, but one of my, one of my favorite things is just your commentary. Um, and, it, we can, we can dive into two pieces because I love your, and that's Mike's camera dying. He'll be back. Um, yeah, that's fine. That's so he, your, your commentary on driving is one of my favorite things because I feel like you have such a good situational awareness of what's going around you on the road at all times. And you're yeah. very good at like taking a look at what's going on to be a good driver. I think you have to. And if you're going to drive like a sports car, a high performance car, like, or an expensive car, you better have great situational situational awareness. So I, I'm curious to understand where the respect, uh, respect the drive came from, and then talk a little bit more about like how you kind of interject this like commentary. And I'm sure up front, maybe you were not comfortable giving out that commentary. Maybe you were, but now you're very comfortable giving out the commentary and I love it. Yeah. So the situational awareness thing is actually very astute of you because that is something I kind of pride myself on and I can prove it because I've had some excellent driving instructors on racetracks and in my log book, they usually write like unbelievable situational awareness because I'm the guy who's like, I, I will never ever hold you up on a straightaway if you've got more yeah. power than me. Right. And I will wreck you in a corner if I can, if I can, if I can get in there with, you know, a, a higher entry speed. Um, right. But you know, they're always like, wow, you're like really paying attention to everything at the same time. And I think that's because I'm a, I've like, I'm an anxious, like little mouse. I literally am a squirrel, <laughs> like, like, Oh, Oh, Oh. And that's like the only reason I can do what I do. I think. Um, and then as far as commentary, my goal with the commentary was always to let the car speak through me. Like, I know that sounds like a little hokey, but the reality is like, I don't want to just tell you like, I think this leather is nice. Like I want the car, I, like you can't feel what I'm feeling. So the, the most like authentic and generous thing I can do for you as a viewer is to let you feel the car through me and try to experience what this is feeling like in my fingertips, like in a Porsche 911, especially like air-cooled cars, no power steering pre-964. So you get in these cars and you're at mid-corner. And as you get on throttle, the front end gets a little bit light. And so what you'll notice is people, people will comment and they say, you're sawing at the wheel. And I'm like, actually, the wheel is doing that. This is what's happening because the front end's getting light. So all you're doing is kind of finding that front end grip and getting the most out of it as you can and then releasing it. But like in cars that have heavily damped power steering, if this is happening, it's because you are actively doing it. Right. Um, and, and there's certain things like that. Like, I want you to know how sensitive is this throttle? What does the brake pedal feel like? And is the modulation consistent and linear or are you afraid to get dive into it? How much does that affect the weight transfer of the car? Have you lost the rear end? If you've had any type of, uh, entry angle at this point. And then, you know, I just, these are all things that I want you to feel like I want to give as much of a tactile experience as possible. Because these are the things that I would have thought of when I was like 17 years old and driving different cars. 
And I think people like I, I take it for granted a little bit just because I'm driving a different car every other day. But when I was like 17, like I had a list when I was 17, 18 years old, I wrote down every car I ever drove. And I think by the time I was 18, I had 120 cars and it was like, and it was just every friend, every single car. And even if I moved it, like in a driveway, I wrote it down. Like I drove this, I drove that, I backed this up. I, you know, I drove this 10 miles, whatever. Um, and I love the, I like, as much as I like going fast and like a little sports car, if you gave me like a crown Vic or a grand Marquis, I love driving at the speed limit, like a limo driver. It felt so cool. Like, Ooh, let me just see how, like, what if I could hit the brakes and not rock the car when we come to a stop, you know, things right. like that. Like that's, that's what I was really into. Um, yeah. so yeah. Yeah. You always have these, these, yeah, exactly. And, and these details that, the details that you like bring into it. I think those nuances are like what draws into is like car enthusiasts. Like, you know, my cars, like they're, they're totally different cars, but you want to understand the nuances between them. And that's kind of also brings in the driving experience. Like you're getting them with the audio, you're getting them with the feel, you're giving them explanation, but you're also saying like, Hey, here's some of these odd nuances with these cars. Here's what it's like on throttle, off throttle on corners. Here's what braking's like. Here's how it feels a highway cruising. Um, I feel like it gives such a, such a good overall just experience. So I love that too. And, the, and then the respect the drive thing, I, I think a little bit more going into that. Like I love when you give like, Hey, here's what the kind of the rules, the it's the rules of the road, but it's also the unwritten rules of the road. So yeah, like, what are your, like, <laughs> cause you always so like, that, you, you go through these, you go through these great videos where we're like, all right. Cause you, like I said, the situational awareness is high, but then you have these like pet peeves or things that everyone should be paying attention to. Um, what makes you want to share those? Because um, I I love them and I think purely, everyone should know them. But I it's like purely ahead. selfish. It's purely selfish because I'm like, <laughs> get the fuck out of the road, like move <laughs> over, like because I I get a little road ragey and I, I for the most part I, I I've stopped. Like I'm like whatever, it's fine. Um, it's a double edged sword though because the thing is when I say when I do these videos, especially like the move over video, where it was like this is how you should be using a highway, right? Um, people take things way too literally because they're like, I can't use the right lane. People are getting on and off the highway. I'm like, I'm not saying like move to the right lane for like 50 feet. So you can jump back over. Like if you are on a stretch and there is 10 miles between these lanes and you are passing nobody get all the way to the right, chill there. As long as the road conditions are fine. Okay, great. Um, and then the, I get commentary when like, if I even make the slightest hint of a pass on the right and undertake somebody, they're like, Oh my God, you're a hypocrite. I'm like, no, yeah. he was hogging the lane and I'm getting away. Uh, but anyway, um, you know, for me, <laughs> this all comes back. This all goes back to the guy in the old E34, 540 IM sport. I learned how to drive from this dude. And I learned how to drive in at speed also watching like gumball 3000 videos back in the day i mean that's what we use street wow. fire and that's what we use um like youtube shout for. out i want shout out at bullion yeah right, well no 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 not well at, this is before him before him long before ed yeah um so this is alex roy this is kim.com this is maximilian cooper this yep. is like some real heavy hitter shit like this kind was of the royal really, rumble before technology too like a lot like before like the real like you know what I mean? Like there was, there's a technology now that obviously like Ed and them had, had, you know, and, and nowadays we see it and during the pandemic, all, you know, there's, it's being broken all the time, but it's like back then it was a dude, it was a wild west of breaking that record. It was incredible. So gumball was different though. Gumball was just a party. Gumball was just around the world. You'd fly, you'd, you'd, you'd put your car on a, on a jet and it would take you, you know, you'd drive across Europe, it would fly you to California and then you'd drive to New York. Yeah. Um, like that, that was crazy. Those are like the real serious heavy hitter, like rallies. Um, and there was a big deal. And that's where like Alex Roy really got his foot in the door. And then he started doing cannonball later on. Um, but like, you know, and that's the other thing, like I'm, I'm heavily involved in the cannonball community because my team has done a 25 hour, 57 minute run. Um, we've done three runs and it is just actually a year to the day today or yesterday was the 25 57 run. Uh, um, so that, that was absolutely crazy. Uh, so that's the third fastest nice. run across the country. Um, some, some contest that it's the second fastest, but we won't get into the details on, on that. Uh, <laughs> But Doug and Arnie definitely hold the record um, for sure. So, but we've we've done some crazy things getting across this this here country. <laughs> How much? Yeah. Uh, well, you, what car was that in? That was a, a new uh, BMW M5 competition. Oh, so <laughs> I, 
I have a, I have a question kind of to cannonball to, to everything you've kind of been saying. And, and so you, you kind of had an early mantra that's shared by a lot of successful YouTubers um, that, that say, you know, do what you love, film what you love, but there's also this kind of mix where sometimes you have to feed the beast, right? You have to fill the algorithm. And do you have like a, like a schedule that you would follow? Is there, is there something that you're like, Hey, I'm going to do like three that I love. <laughs> uh, not an Aston Martin video. I'm going to do whatever color cars I like, yeah. <laughs> but then I have to put this one in cause I got to get clicks. I got to get views. I got to grow my community or is it just strictly, Hey, just film what you love. Well, so I film everything because the reality is if I only film the cars I like, then I don't have enough to base my opinion on. I have to drive everything. So if I don't drive the occasional Hyundai or like base Mercedes or whatever, like I can't really give relatable comparisons to people because if you don't know what a base Civic feels like, how is somebody with a base Civic supposed to understand what you're saying if you can't relate it to them? So mm -hmm. There are cars that I sometimes like jokingly relate, like, you know, I'll be like, okay, I know this is not a good comparison, but this shifter feels a lot like a Testarossa. <laughs> like I know people don't know what that means. Um, but I think you have to be able to, you have to, in order to be in this game, in order to be able to review cars and make a review relatable and say whether something is either fast, slow, tactile, numb, this, that, like you need to have some benchmark comparisons. Um, yeah. No, that, that makes total sense too, is because I never thought of it that way where your, your channel is based on the relatability and obviously the binaural audio is specifically to those who care for cars and love cars, but the experience that you need to do is wider. And that's, that's what gets your growth. The, the experience of driving these things. And it might be the guy who currently has a civic and he wants to buy this car or he currently has this car. He might even have the new E-class Mercedes. And he's like, Oh, I drive that, but I want to buy this vintage vehicle. What's it like? And, and if so you can have a relationship between those and watch two videos and understand the driving experience through them, that's a great thing to do. I think for most people, um, who have not driven many cars, I think they would think it's easier for them to drive a supercar and review that than drive a civic. Yeah. Whereas for me, I find it. Well, actually, no, I think they think it would be easier to review the civic than the supercar. I find it easier to review the supercar than the civic because the civic I need to be on. I need to be really tapped into this vehicle. And the other thing is if I'm wrong or if I'm like, if I'm not feeling something that everyone else in the world feels because they sell like tens of thousands of these, <laughs> I'm an idiot. But here's the deal. If I mess up or I'm like a little wrong about a car that maybe 12 people are going to drive in the next 10 years, no one's ever going to know. But you know, that's not the really the reason. The reason is that I think most people think that like if I, a lot of people want to be an automotive YouTuber and I get it. Like, of course, it looks like, wow, I want to drive the car and talk about it. Like who wouldn't yeah. want to do that? Um, but I think a lot of people would find it a lot harder to do what I do if they actually got behind the wheel of like a seven, 800 horsepower supercar and had to go full boot and talk about it in real time without a script, because that's what I do. I have no script. I memorize a few facts just so I have them to like relate like, okay, this is the power. This is the engine displacement. We've got twin turbos. We've got rear wheel steering. We've got, and like, honestly, half the time, I don't know if a car is rear wheel steering until I turn it in and then I go, Ooh, it's got rear wheel steering. And then I look it up later and make sure I'm right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just to double check. But like, you know, uh, it, it is, it is a skill that I didn't know I had until I watched other, until I asked, when you ask other people, what they're feeling when they're driving. That's when I'm like, Oh, I actually have a skill. Like this is actually a thing that I've developed over time because I do it every day. Um, most people don't have, I don't know. Most people don't feel the certain, the certain things. And the best thing I did recently was I interviewed Valentino Balboni, uh, the ex chief test yes. driver for Lamborghini. That was, that was awesome by the way. And I, thank you. I just had the best time. Cause I'm like, on a much different 
level, I do the same job he does. I mean, my job is to interpret what the car is doing and communicate it to somebody. Now, his job is to interpret it and communicate it back to engineers. My job is to, is to interpret it and give it to viewers. Um, and it was really fascinating watching him operate a car and seeing some of the things that I do that he does. And I was like, oh my God, like, I think I, I think I'm a test driver. This is crazy. <laughs> like, this is so wild that I'm watching this. I mean, obviously his, his, his butt is calibrated on another level, but you know, it is very interesting to get into a car and sometimes some of the same cars and see the differences between the two. Like I drive, I drive the same car over and over again, like whether they're like E-type Jags or I did, you know, the launch you were talking about the Zagato. I drove, so that was a 1969 with a four speed. I drove a 1972 coupe with the same engine, but a five speed dog leg, literally two days later. So, yeah. you know, huh. I, and I'm like, Oh, the steering on this car is completely different. It's like so much heavier and more tactile than the Zagato. I wonder what's going on there. And then this gearbox, although the gear ratios are a lot more favorable for speed, the gates are a little trickier to find and the precision is not there. Um, so it's an upgrade for paper on speed, but it's not an upgrade on tactility. And like, these are those weird things where like, if you were trying to have someone buy a car, those are those things that you want to talk about. Like, well, what do you prefer? You know, 911s, they all look the same. They all, I've never driven a 911 that drove, drove, even if it's the same year, same car, they all drive different. Really? Yeah, that's crazy. Every, and every single one. So I feel like the, the rule of thumb there is if you're looking for one, you got to test drive it before you get into you it. You have to drive stuff. That's why whenever people yeah. ask me, should I buy this or that? I say, watch the videos I did on both and then you go drive it and tell me because I can't tell you what you like. I can right. only tell you what I like and what I like might actually, what I don't like might actually be what you like. And even though you disagree with me, that may still help your decision. Very much so. And I think like what you said earlier is you, you between the Lamborghini driver, the one thing that you guys share in, in common is a passion for cars and the culture and the experience behind driving the wheel. And so it's kind of like surfing in my mind, um, where it doesn't matter if you're on a 10 foot weight or board on a two foot wave, or you're, you know, riding something super fun and, and a great day on a, on a reef, the experience is just the same and everyone smiles and everyone's happy because it's, it's personal. And yeah. so but you can share it and you can talk about it with people who have the same mentality and love. I pretty much decline no cars. I mean, I get a lot of offers, so I do have to decline cars, but they're only declined when they're either completely out of the way and it's just like unfeasible or it's like the business case isn't there where I'm like, yeah, I personally want to drive this, but like I've got a few other things in the lineup that I need to get done before that happens because I know they'll get more views or I'll know like it's better for the portfolio, you know? Yeah. 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 Your, your channel right now, especially is such a good resource. And we talked about it before and everyone knows it, but like the used car market, especially is like, it's so hot right now. And with so many people with a lot of money buying up these used cars that maybe aren't even that rare. Um, but well, they, they have a, a there's a, a bit of rareness to them. They're, it's more special than it is rare, I guess I would say. Um, cause yeah. I see a lot of cars where like you have special cars that, that people have made, like you said, the 540, the, the 540 IM sport, like that is a, yeah, it is rare, but it's also a special car. So there's, there's these different pieces to it, but now people are utilizing your channel as a great research funnel and a great way to get their first look at some of these cars. Do you think that has a, a lot to weigh in? And do you see, I'd be curious to see if certain cars go up on bring a trailer, if you get a little more traffic on those like past searches, you know, on, on your channels. So I actually, if you, if you look closely, um, I've sold with my videos and photos, a lot of cars on bring a trailer. Um, so okay. I, uh, yeah, I think Sirio, I've seen a few of them. A so Sirio, few of them. Yeah. So a, anytime, um, bond group or, you know, Sirio puts a car up on bring a trailer, the photos are mine and the driving videos are mine. And yeah. it was really intimidating in the beginning because I would be like handed uh, a, a two forty six Dino Euro spec. Right. And it's like the first, like uh, for a while, this was the first time I was driving cars of this nature, you know, old alpha 1957 alpha Romeo, Julieta sprint Veloce. Like it's done the mille milia three times. And I'm the guy that has to display it. I'm the guy who has to go show it off. Like this is what it can do. Yeah. And the intimidation the POV, of the POV shots for the, for the channel. Yeah. And the, now not yeah. only, not only are you fighting for like, you're, 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 you're putting up these heavy hitters. So you know that real people are watching, you know, that actual race car drivers 
actual car brokers, actual people who own these in the in period are watching these. And you're trying to A, live up to their nostalgia and B, not look like a, a noob. And right. <laughs> you know, that's the thing I think I'm most yeah. And that's I think the thing I'm most proud of is that I've been able to display these cars for sale, drive them within a reasonable limit that shows off like it's mechanically sound and this is how fun it could be for you. Um, and we're selling, you know, we've sold the, uh, the DB4 sold for $830,000 last week. Jeez. You know, I mean, that's, that's the level we're doing with these cars and, you know, uh, Bizzarini, I did, um, that car sold for one and a quarter, I think. Um, so, I mean, we're, sometimes we're doing like well over a million dollars with these cars and, it's, it's such an honor and a privilege to have been a trusted with them, but B I'm like so proud that I've had such a ridiculous amount of cars that I've driven. And I still am nowhere near where I want to be. Like there's still a million cars I need right. to drive, but like to be able to get behind the wheel of these cars and be confident and comfortable and know what it's telling you, you know, I've driven like Ferrari 250 GT and Inferina coupes, you know, that's like the, the convertible version of that would be the Ferris Bueller car, right? And then the right. crazy version would be the 250 GTO, which is a seventy million dollar. And you can't seventy uh, million like, dollar no. car. Well, it's yeah. one of the most expensive cars of all time, essentially. Yeah, it, it is. It's crazy. Um, so, I mean, that's the thing. Like to be able to have dr- operated a lot of these cars and operated them in different variations, different stages of production, to be like, oh, this one has the ZF, and this one has the Moss. You know, you get an old yeah, Jaguar. Oh, it's yeah. the Moss box. You, you know, yeah. You sometimes like they the, are very frustrating. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, there's always, and there's the, there's those mid, those mid, um, chassis updates too, where it's like, you have like the LCI updates on E, you know, E60 and fives or whatever it might be. You have all these different pieces. Oh, I have a challenge for you then. Um, because this is the least, uh, amount, and it's a car that I love and I, I really want one. I've potentially got my eye on one and this might be torpedo torpedoing my own capabilities of buying one, but find somebody or find someone who has a 2010 um, or 2011, I think was the last year of the M156 on a CLS 63 AMG. There is no reviews of CLS 63 AMG with the 6.2 out I've there. I've actually never been. I've never been in one. I've been in a CLS 55, but I've never been in a CLS 63. So That's I will. I, mean, I will hunt around, and it's a it's beautiful crazy. car. Yeah, they're they're great, and there's there may there might be one for sale near me that I've been looking at. They do fantastic there. routes. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of great rare cars. Um, there's actually, you know, I think it, it's funny, like you pop into my mind time and time again, cause I'll watch your, I'll watch your <laughs> channel. Like while I'm like sending out emails or something like that for work. <laughs> um, but the lady, the lady that lives, um, next to me here and I, and I live up in Washington, she has one of seven presidential, um, editions of an E55 AMG one of seven that they only gave out to the C-level executives and she knew one of the executives and she has it here. And she goes, Oh no. She goes, if I ever would ever sell it, I have to sell it back to him. There's no other choice. That's incredible. And it's such a rare car, such a rare car. But I think about you a lot because I'm like, Oh, you know, who'd like to get behind the wheel of this. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And that's, those are those cars where like, the car is great. And I'm, I'm more about like, Oh, the driving experience, but I would find joy in that car because what I would do is I would get all the nitty gritty details. And I would call my buddy, Will, uh, PTSRS, who is like one of my closest friends. And he's the one who's really into like nitty gritty details where he's like, Oh, they never offered this color of leather on anything except for this. And right. then, Oh my God, it has the stitching on the glove box. They've never, you know, like that's, that's well one. That's yeah. his thing. And so, <laughs> you know, we, we've walked into some Porsche collections uh, that have just been staggering where literally one of one cars, like we, we went into a collection in California and he has the only street legal 935 Porsche in existence. Um, yeah. And it was built for the guy who owned Oira. Uh, I forget his name. I'm really bad. So this is the thing that's like, to me, I'm just like, Oh my God, a 935. And he's like, this is the one, you know, uh, you know, and, and, and that's the thing. It's like, it's really fun to appreciate cars with people who are into different things. Um, and that's what we do. You know, I was yeah. in New York with him. Just, uh, I, we were in New York because we wanted to see Will and we were having dinner with JF Musual, who's the guy who runs drive the drive network or used to run yep. the drive network. Now he does okay. tangent vector and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and you know, they were, they, they had a super top secret Porsche that they were filming that day. And so we got to go and play around and see some stuff with that. And, you know, 
I don't know. It's just, it's always good to have people who value different parts, different parts of the automotive experience, because sometimes it reminds me of things that like, Oh, my audience actually would care about that. I should talk more about this detail. Yeah. It's fantastic. And I love that. It's like, you've gone from the, you've gone from, you know, a career in engineering where it wasn't so much like, yeah, people will help lift you up only if it helps lift themselves up. But now you are more of a, a, a higher tide raises all boats uh, area where you in this community that you've built and you've been a part of and that you keep adding to um, keeps adding more content, more of what the viewers want to watch. So it's awesome to see what you've done with your channel or with your channel and, and what you've done with your, you know, your career as going into YouTube. So um, yeah, I, mean, I guess, you know, a lot of it's luck though. You know, it's like, a lot of it is like, I guess I just hit a chord at the right time. And that's like, it's like a trend, right? You, you, there's so many people I I was, I was related to like actors, right? Like there's so many actors who can make a living wage and can do what they're doing. And like, I'm kind of at that level right now. And, but you know, then there's only going to be like a handful of those like Marvel actors or those Oscar winning actors. Like there's, there's a very small circle of those people. And like those people, you know, in YouTube land, it's like Mr. Beast and Casey Neistat and that kind of stuff. It's like right. the automotive guys, we're never going to be there, but we have our own little circle. And right now, like the heavy hitters are like, I mean, James uh, Stradman is probably one of the heavier hitters right now. And like, I'm so proud of what he does. And he, he, I, he taught me a lot of lessons early on. And he probably barely remembers this conversation, but we spent like two hours in his Lamborghini and we just talked about YouTube when I was like at 10,000 subscribers. Right. And he told me a million lessons and I'm like, I've taken them all to heart. And that's, I think that's kind of where this, this went. Yeah. But if you go back and you look at the Marvel actor and you look at Mr. Beast, Mr. Beast started no, no different than what your channel started, right? Just like posting little things, the Marvel actor, they took things that were a little out of the caliber of what they wanted. Maybe like a, a toy commercial or uh, something else. They got to start somewhere. They got to build the brand. They got to learn the things that you learn the same way that everyone does. And it just takes time, consistency. You're totally right. And use yeah, your you network. Chris Pratt. I mean, you got to do the Chris Pratt. Yeah, yeah so the Chris Pratt move. Exactly. Yeah. He, he, it's unbelievable. Parks, <laughs> yeah. And, Parks and Recs, and then you're the badass in every war movie, in military movie, <laughs> and now Jurassic Park, which I love him in very much. It's uh, crazy. But no, it, it's great to see because like I, I love the car community so much. And you know, living in certain areas where it's like, I havenven't always had it. It's like, I can always go on YouTube and watch and see what yeah. you guys do. So it's great that you guys all let's each other up and build more content. So that's awesome. Um, and I know we've, we've kept you for a bit here. Um, I've got, you know, we talked about a couple channels, um, but, but who else are you watching? And do you spend much time on YouTube, uh, outside of what you do for a living? Um, and out, maybe there's some people in the car community that you love watching and you always stay up to date with, but do you have any guilty pleasures outside of the automotive world on YouTube? Like, are you so watching just, Serpa design? Are these guys like, you know what I mean? Are you watching somebody build terrariums? Like what's going on? <laughs> I think so. All right. Actually. Oh, this is going to go really, really far south in a second. So <laughs> for YouTube, I, I don't watch that much YouTube because I used to, and I would, I would watch like Sam seen through glass was like a big one. Um, Seb Delaney back in the early days, but he's a little too like young, modern dude now for me. I'm like an old, Fogey. So I'm like, I'm good. Um, and then, uh, so see through glass occasionally here and there, like it used to be a thing that I was obsessed with and I'm not, you know, no offense to Sam, but it's like, I, you know, I don't need it every day. Um, cars with Luke. I love Luke. Um, I love what he's doing out in Switzerland. He makes incredible content. He's a, he's a, just a, such a talented cinematographer and I, I can't recommend his videos enough. If you just need to like sit back and enjoy some visual awesomeness yeah. of these cinematography and, and yeah. yeah. Well, shot. um, and, and then when it comes to non YouTube, which is most of my viewing non automotive YouTube, I get really sucked into like aviation stuff. Um, but a lot of times, Oh, this is so bad. I I've got a good one. If you, if you know it, I know it. I will watch like a, I will discover a plane crash and then I will just <laughs> hunt for every detail of this plane crash. possible. <laughs> oh and yeah. then the worst thing is by, by like 2 AM, I, I am, I'm reluctantly typing in like black box recordings. Cause like, I want to hear what they said yeah, and which then is, sometimes you'll get it. And you're like, Oh God, I wish I didn't listen to that. I do the same thing. I have a morbid <laughs> curiosity. No, I have a morbid curiosity. I have to know what it's like so went down in the cockpit. Like you have to kind of yeah. understand it's, it's weird. I do. You know what? I think I blocked that out for myself. Cause I also do that. 
Um, yeah, no, I, I, I didn't think no I had an answer man. until I started talking. I was like, Oh, I have an answer. Oh, no, this is but that's interesting because it's 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 it goes back to like where you started with like almost vehicles and and engineering. It's tying everything together, and it it's Pilot. forcing you to understand because I'm sure you're not listening to like the the sadness of what's happening, but you're listening to like okay, how did they break down what happened? Oh, what did they try? Oh, did they try? Oh crap, did they try this? And then now you're going back to like your whole mentality of like. Oh, but they were, they were flying, uh, 1974. Uh, I don't know. I know nothing less about planes than this, this, sure. and Oh, maybe it has these kinds of shot at go down these paths and you can figure out like what the plane was, maybe like break it down. Like it, well, it so the, the, the thing that I like about it is that it puts you in a position where you, you can hear what panic looks like and you can see the actions taken from panic. Huh. And this is the thing. So the same thing happens in a car all the time. How many times have you had someone say like, I almost hit this deer or whatever. And then you see their dash cam video and you're like, what the fuck are you talking about? You were like nowhere near this deer. <laughs> you, and you, you, why did you turn left? That was the wrong move. What are you like, doing? What are you thinking? What, yeah, what, you're going to turn like, into oncoming traffic. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, your instincts were way off and you actually just made escalated the situation. So when I listen to these That's planes, so like there's two, there's two accidents that I, that I like really obsessed over. One is the Concorde flight Paris, which obviously yep. everybody knows about. Um, but the, the anatomy of that accident was just such a horrible series of events that was like really unavoidable. Like no one was going to survive that. There was no, there was no aborting that they did what they could do. And you know, it was already on fire. It was done. But then there was a C-17, which is a huge, huge aircraft that crashed. Um, somebody shot it. Is that the, is that the, is that the load shift? Uh, no, that was a 747 in Afghanistan. Um, that okay. one was um, unbelievable too, but that's a, that's a great one to figure out. But this, the C-17, it's even bigger than a 747 and yeah. it took off and it did these like big clearing turns, but they were at an airspeed too low for this, the bank angle they were at, like all of the, all of the safety checks and there's a safety officer on board. Nobody's calling it out. And by the time it's gone wrong, the audio recordings, which they never released, but they have the transcripts. They're saying like, they're saying way too late speeds, too low speeds, too low speeds, too low. And the thing just falls out of the sky and it's unbelievable. C said, it's like, no, hold on. No I think this was right? B 50. I think it was a B 52 at an air show. This well, there was that too, but this is a C okay, uh, flying yeah. Gal- galaxy, galaxy or whatever yeah, that it's huge, called. Yeah. yeah, you see it's a, a couple rare of video. And, you see that and, side stall, and it's just the most unbelievable accident because it was the dumbest, most preventable thing, and and nobody spoke up. And kind of a hot shot happens, pilot, kind of a hot shot pilot move. Yeah, and it shows what happens when you have sometimes when hierarchy and seniority. Um, rules the roost rather than logic reason and uh, and your actual position on the airplane because that safety officer 100 should have known this was going wrong literally 70 seconds after takeoff well you, yeah. you, you see That's you tough. see that after world war ii there's things that hopefully would help to say obviously this is a small like a smaller niche case of it but like you know if something's going wrong in the hierarchy you you need to speak out or else you're liable for all the mistakes. Yes. But for a good pilot who's like, so the only aviation channel I watch that's like a, a YouTuber, this guy, Matt Guthmiller, um, he is a, he was the youngest, I think he was the youngest pilot to solo around the world when he was a kid. He went to MIT. He's about our age. Um, he flies a Bonanza mm-hmm. and he just, he just goes out and flies and he's an amazing pilot. And he, I don't know, man, it just, he's, he's doing that aviation dream. Like if I had, yeah. You know, if I had like money to buy a house in the mountains and just drive my sports cars, like that's his equivalent, but with this Bonanza. Yeah. Well, then I, you should um, take, take, note this down, Citation Max. He's very good. Oh, I've seen him. Yeah, I know. He's great. Very good. Love his content. Love what he does. Kind of talks you through it. He's always going back and forth. Of course, he's selling like surgical supplies. And it's like, I can't imagine how much it's costing him to own and operate his own private jet, but I'm sure it's a business expense for him. Well, you know, <laughs> it's funny though. Like, so I, I, I can private pay for a few. I've flown private a couple of times and it's one of those things where like, there's the moment where you're like, I can't believe I'm on this plane, but like my best friends and this is what we're doing. And like, Oh my God, we have a G five to ourselves and we have like all, you know, it's incredible, but like, it's amazing how quickly you get used to anything you're doing. And this is a lesson with the cars as well, because you know, if you see me driving an LFA or you see me driving, like hopefully fingers crossed a career GT someday, like 
I don't get starstruck by cars very much anymore because I recognize that they're all just cars and I try to appreciate them for what they are while I'm driving them. And it helps me communicate better to the audience what I'm feeling if I'm not starstruck by it, because I can have a better conversation with the car if I'm listening to it rather than just ogling it. Yeah. Um, and so I think, you know, when, even if I'm driving like you know, an Aventador, phenomenal car, but like people cannot fathom that you're driving this vehicle. Like uh, you pull up to a hotel and you get out of an Aventador Roadster and like people standing in the hotel are like, what? yeah. And I'm like, I, and I'm like, I just drove this thing 400 miles. I'm exhausted. I want to go to bed. Like that's, yeah. that's what I'm doing. And like, it's just interesting. And I think the, 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 the thing I've learned a lot about just any of it is that any type of car, any type of wealth, whatever you're doing in life, um, there's always another level because if you have an Aventador, guess what? Somebody's got a Wyra. If you've yeah, got, somebody's, a got Manza, a car exact. somebody's got a citation. Um, and, and the reality is like, you got to try to be happy where you're at because there's always a level up and you might get there. You might not, and it might not be for you anyway. It might not be the life you want to lead and that's fine, but, um, never feel one up by anybody. And the respect the drive thing goes for everybody. It's, it doesn't matter if you're driving a civic SI or an event or SVJ, like the reality is you're operating a vehicle and you need to be, you need to be aware and you need to have, you know, go ahead, have fun, but I can have just as much fun and pretty, I can have a lot of fun and pretty much any, you can put me in behind the wheel of anything. I'm going to have a good time. Yeah. That actually brings up a great point because there's something that I talk to people a lot about. So I have a, I have a stage two B five S four 2000, which is a fantastic car and it's, it's great and it's tuned and it's fast and all that, but I have a bone stock Integra GSR and the bone stock Integra GSR 1997 one owner. Um, <laughs> Slow cars fast. You have been preaching this for so long. Slow cars fast is one of my sayings. I say it to people all the time. People want to buy these crazy fast cars nowadays that are just insane to drive. And within a matter of seconds, you're breaking the speed limit. Uh, you can get arrested. You can do a hundred miles an hour and, and so quickly that you'll, you'll be arrested. They'll tow your car. You do that. But like my GSR, I mean, I can drive, I can drive the absolute wheels off that thing and be doing pretty good for the most part. Slow cars fast. What's your take? And the GSR, so my take hundred percent slow car fast. Like I love, I love, I love Hondas, man. I fucking love Hondas. So the GSR is fantastic because you've got, you've got such a happy, revy, characterful engine. Like that is such a blast. It makes incredible sounds and the sound, the pitch, uh, it, it evolves like a Porsche. Mm -hmm. It's as close as you can get to that, like GT3 level of evolution between idle and redline. The gearbox is just, Ooh, Oh my God. Every throw is dead on. There's never crunch. And it, the thing is the way that car drives, it drives better at red line than anywhere else in the reverend. It is it's fast hard. up there. It's not, it's kind of fast up there. It's great. It's almost <laughs> hard to drive that car slow because when you try to do, especially cold, that one, two is a little bit like, yeah. take your time. You might need to give it a little blip because you've waited so long to actually engage the gear, you know, but that car, is just one of the most entertaining things you can operate. I love an Integra GSR. Um, and then you get into like, I don't know, th th there are better slow cars than others. And I think like the Civic SI, the eighth gen Civic SI was one of the greatest things because it's very similar to that Integra. It's just a yep. little faster. Um, yep. And th those are probably some of my favorite things to drive. Um, you know, Cayman 987.1, 987.2, phenomenal to drive. Um, you do not need more than 250 horsepower to have a good time. Um, and you know, you really, depending on the weight, you don't need more than hundred horsepower. I've driven K cars with 38 horsepower. I've driven like Honda Acties and had a fucking blast when you go, I mean, uh, how often do you get to go wide open for like 25 seconds? Never. You know what That's I mean? what I'm saying. You can't. <laughs> if I do 25 seconds wide open and just, just a stage two B five S four, I'm probably doing 135. Uh, maybe more than that. I don't know. It's going to be tomorrow morning. So probably I guess yeah. you'd be maxed out. Yeah. Tomorrow morning, my aerial Adam four video goes up oh. and that, that car, I mean, it's zero to, I don't think I did it, but like it can do zero to 60 and 2.8, zero to 106.8. Um, I mean, that's like some serious shit. And I, yeah. I, you know, I'm ripping through four gears and I blur the speedo a couple times in the video, but at some point you're just like, I mean, fucking look, this is the deal. <laughs> this thing is that fast. And uh, I don't know what to tell you. Like, and, and the reality is like, it's more entertaining to drive a slow car near the limit just because it's safe. I mean, you can still be on the grit level of adhesion where it's like, Whoa, we're, but you know, 
I, I also think that people get a false sense of being a good driver because they're in a fast car. Whereas yes. like, I never feel like a better driver than when I'm driving like a caterer. Like if I'm driving like a mm-hmm. hundred horsepower car that weighs like 1200 pounds, that's when I'm like, I am speed. Like I feel like I am really operating the thing. Every, yeah. Everything's kind of in sync. You're, you're, you're driving with this thing on the same, the same wavelength that it wants to be operated on. Right. Essentially. But like, I mean, and the problem too, is that like supercars today are, and not even supercars, it's, it's not fair to call a 911 a supercar, but like a GT3 RS or a GT2 RS or a Huracan, these cars are objectively very easy for anyone to get in and drive very, very, very quickly. Like they are not intimidating in the least bit. Once you get over the fact that like hit pedal, go fast, like you can drive. The reward. Like you can, yeah. But the reward yeah. drops down some, at some point it's like you're you, like the reward of that experience eventually is going to wear off if you're not the one yeah. that's operating. Right. And the GT three, like, so I'm not a save the manuals purist as much as I love a manual gearbox. Like I can respect a great paddle shifting car. Yeah, sure. um, and like, you know, I I'm there, I li- I'm with it. But like when I drive a GT three RS, trust me, like the first thing I'm thinking is not, I wish I was rowing my own gears. I'm like, Oh, like you're just hanging on for dear life. And you're just staring at the tack because the gearing is so long. And you're like, okay, we got to get yeah. it all the way to nine grand. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> but like you're just like this thing is so stupid fast and why am i able to do this like i am not a i mean i guess technically i'm a professional driver at this point <laughs> but like i'm, I'm not, not a race good, car yeah, driver you are. Yeah, you are. i mean i mean but like you're a journalist. You, know, so you, you can do things and man and that like I, I tell you some journalists really don't know what they're doing behind the wheel and i'm not gonna like call people out but like i would just read carefully and watch the you know there are there are a select few people in this industry that are great drivers um and i'll call some of them out like for being good drivers like chris amos phenomenal driver mark yes, from savage mark from savage geese phenomenal driver oh yeah these he's people- awesome savage geese is such a good channel such a good, gotta, yeah. i love those guys so much and they're so I mean, goddamn these, funny these are the people to trust when they tell you what they felt okay and then then there's a lot of people you should never listen to who get a lot of publicity. And usually they tip me off with little things, you know, and I, I like you, you hear them sit, mention something about a car where you go, Oh, that's just that. Like for me, I, I, a good joke is like when somebody tells you the steering on an E39 M5 is good. Stop listening to everything else they say. Rack and pinion verse. Come on, steering let's go. Box. It's a, it's a steering box. I mean, it's like a joke. I mean, and then people it, it, who don't have an M5 don't get that because yeah, the M5, the 540 and below had the rack five, and pinion, not a box. The non V8s had the, all the all the straight sixes had uh, rack and pinions. <laughs> and so then those guys different language. This is me. big nerd. It's, this is big car nerd. Talk. This is yeah. this is why this is why like car. I, I think the the reputation of men who are into cars being macho is such a laughable joke to me because we are nerds. literally no we are we are we are kids with Asperger's and Pokemon cards like that's <laughs> what that's the level we're at we are on the Big spectrum and we just want to talk about nerdy things and then when someone says like no 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 Pikachu's HP is seven not twelve like <laughs> you know that's <laughs> that's every comments. automotive that's every the best automotive fight that's the best reference I've ever had from from exactly <laughs> what it is because I next to my desk when I'm stressed out, I, I look at my Pokemon cards because I'm like, should I sell these right now? I'm like, I'm like, man. And then I go and I Google a little bit when I'm a minute. I'm like, okay, this is worth this much. But I'm like, oh, but you know what? I go back. I'm like, but when I was playing with this, like, you know, 15 years ago, like this is a good, this is, this is the one that you want to keep. Like if it, Pokemon really comes back and I'm going to play it later on, I want to have this card, you know, something like that. Yeah. But at the end of the day, there is in this, in this field, there is like just the way you can always be like a wealthier person with a, you know, Oh, sure. You have a Pagani, but do you have a yacht? You know, right. The same way it goes for like knowledge of cars and nothing is more like a bigger slap in the face than going to like a legitimate concourse event and watching judges approach a thing you didn't even know existed. (laughs) And then talking about why this one isn't as good as the last one they saw. And you're like, what is happening? Yeah. They're like, actually, well, that was a, that was a, it was a steel before. Now it's aluminum on this year, but only this year on there. You're like, what? What are you talking about? And that's when you're like, there are people with a wealth of knowledge that I just, 
cannot possibly have. I don't Sounds think like. I could learn it and I could be around it all my life and I still wouldn't retain it. Uh, but at the end of the day, all I want to do is drive the car. So I'm fine letting those people nerd out on all the details. I just want to let you know if it's a good time. And that's it. That's good. No, <laughs> and you know what? I love and the, and they'll, they'll let you know in the comments if you're wrong. So, yeah. so <laughs> no, but I do, I do love that you interact with your comments. Like I've, I've commented on your stuff for years now and you're, you've always, you know, it's either a like or a comment or a thanks or something like that. So you've been very, very good to your audience. And I think that's really important to your brand and, and who you are and how you share things. So um, very much appreciate yeah. that. This has been an absolute pleasure. I mean, you guys could talk cars for hours. I'm sure I, I, I drive a Toyota four runner. It literally has, uh, about as much horsepower as, uh, it needs to go to 70 miles an hour and be comfortable. And that's about it. So, but you did, help me, but you, know, you did, but you did help me swap, um, uh, headers onto a Honda civic 1.7 yeah. liter Honda civic single overhead cam in your driveway. So you got a little street credit. I, I, I can do, I can do the work. I just don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I don't know. It's You're true. like, but it's, true. It, it, it's easy. Like I'm, I'm kind of like what you would you, know, you take the, take the engine apart. I can put it back together. I couldn't tell you what's inside of it. I can, I can take apart and put together. That's true. But uh, other than having bought a new nine, nine, one GT three touring, the forerunner holds value better than pretty much anything in the world. So mm. w- wise financial decision. On oh, well, my, my car before this was a Tacoma and I literally sold it for $2,000 less than what I bought it for four years That's after it. I got it. And the Incredible. only reason I bought a new one was because I went to go buy a Tacoma because I love the Tacoma and I showed up to the freaking uh, lot and the guy's like, okay, you could buy this one. It's brand new 2015 or 2014 and it's 26,000. Uh, or you could buy that one and it's three years old and it is 22,000. And I was like, well, why would I do <laughs> no, with that? like 80,000 miles? Off. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, well, why would I do that? And like, and then I bought my forerunner and literally two, maybe three weeks ago, they, someone from my dealership here who I get a service at, cause I'm still under Toyota care, which is the greatest thing in the whole wide world. Uh, called me. He's like, you ever interested in selling your car? I'm like, mm, not really. He's like, does it have two keys? I'm like, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> they're I so lazy. Three. That's the laziest <laughs> question in the world. They don't want to well, no, 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 they're they're bucks for a new keys. They're like, no. I am not paying two fifty for this shit. Two, 250 <laughs> bucks for a new key. Fuck that. No, no Toyota. You can't buy a new Toyota right now and get two keys. You get one key and an IOU. If oh you my buy God. A brand new Toyota. Wow, that's, that's ridiculous. Fantastic. But so that's buy, amazing. He, he offered me more money than what I bought it for. I'm like, we are in a terrifying state of vehicles. So yeah. You're like, what am I supposed to drive? Um, so what before I sell before it to you, we, and what do I do? Like what, what, what's going to happen? Like I can't buy another car right now. Cause what do I want to buy a four runner? And I'm going to pay $13,000 on MSRP. Heck no. Yeah. <laughs> is there Sorry, anything we didn't hit? Is there anything we didn't hit? On well, no, what list? else? What, um, what I yeah, want to say is, well, I, you might, I don't think on my list, list, but yeah, go ahead. Okay. So, uh, one thing I noticed on your channel is in about four years ago, you're a very clean cut, clean shaven had, uh, you, you were like polo shirts and short, like a lot of things here. What happened to allow you to, <laughs> to let you, so, no, I'm just kidding. So like when, when what happened to you, you, you <laughs> did your job and now you're just like, you got long hair, you're growing a beard. What, is that just because you're, that's the true you and you were forced to have clean cut, clean shaven or what, what's going on? There? I think so. So I think, I think like, as we grow up, we all go through different phases. Also, depending on who we're dating, we go through different phases. Yeah. Like, you know, like there was, I dated someone who was like just the most well-dressed, like well-cultured person. So I was just like, okay. So I literally just thank God. I mean, that's the thing is if you're gay and you date people who are around the same size as you, you can just wear their clothes. <laughs> yeah. Just absorb so, it. Like, like, I'll just take I, that jacket. My wardrobe was insane. We'd go to weddings and people would like, we'd look better than the people in the wedding party. And I was <laughs> like, this is the greatest. But now I'm like, holy shit, where's my last suit? Like, this is bad. Um, but no, I think um, I think pandemic probably got me a little scruffier. I stopped cutting my hair uh, because of the, because like, I just didn't want to go to a barber at the time. Like, it was like, oh my God, we can't be in a building, right? But then it became like, oh, well, I wonder how long this could get before yeah. I get a break. Um, and I think I'm just kind of a scruffy dude. Like, I'm somebody who wants to put on a t-shirt and some shorts and the same jeans I wear every single day. And like Will Lee always says to me, like when I was early days of the YouTube channel, like me going full time, I remember he looked at me and I had these jeans, these black jeans, and there was a big hole in them. And he looked at me and just dead serious goes, 
Tom, you can afford pants. And that was like, I was like, oh fuck, I'm going way too like lean on my financials right now. <laughs> like you're not poor. That's the, you're yeah, not poor conversation. Like I'm getting into my nine 11 and he's like, Tom, you can afford pants. And yeah, yeah. it's like, you're so, doing, you're doing a full tank correction and restoration on your M five. You can buy a pair of jeans, buddy. But I, will I love that though. Cause it's, it's that, that to me is one of the best things about the pandemic in corporate America is we used to be like polo or not even polo shirts. So you had to wear a suit tie everything. And now I go to my office and everyone's wearing jeans. Most of the sea level people are wearing t-shirts. There's a lot of beards. It, it opened up the idea. Like we don't need to be this serious as much. No, so, but I did fantastic. fix my teeth. I got Invisalign. So I'm on the tail end of my Invisalign. I always want oh, to fix yeah. my teeth. So that's like, Which, that's like my big thing. Which, well, by the way, thing, I hopped on your, your, I hopped on your, your hands because it's just the other channel sees, right? <laughs> yeah. And I was on your Instagram live for like uh, like a minute and a half today, and somebody was asking you about your Invisalign. So I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> well, uh, I, had to get like, off. I was always like, oh, I, I'm going to do this off camera. Like, no, we want to watch it. So now there's like this disgusting trend of like, I take out my Invisalign while I'm on the Instagram live, and people are like, oh, sweet. How many weeks are you in? Like, I'm like, oh, okay. So whatever I, I give I the know. people what they want. It's fucked up. I, you <laughs> yeah. do. And I, and I love that. You got to feed the beast. You gotta feed <laughs> yeah. the beast. It's a great thing about your channel. You give the people what you want. I've been a, a long time, long time follower. Um, I comment on a lot of your stuff. So I'm, I'm just glad that I'm happy to finally get you here and chat with you. And it's, it's a better Likewise. experience than I thought it would be. So it's been awesome. Um, I'm sure one time when we get up there, um, you know, if I head up to Pennsylvania or Mike is, maybe we'll have to make a trip to come see her or out yeah, a way that sure. if we're all in the same place sometime, we'd love to connect. Um, I think most importantly, you know, we a appreciate you being here, chatting with us, talking about your community, talking about us, how you got started, what the decisions were that got you into YouTube, um, you know, where you are now. And then I think most importantly is, you know, tell everyone a little bit about where they can follow you. If you got any other sort of Patreons or anything like that, feel free to mention those. We'll add them in the social below, um, but bring those up and then let us know what we can expect from you in the future. Sure. So obviously on YouTube, Tedward, you'll find me. Uh, that's easy. Uh, Instagram is, I'm like sitting like a child right now. I'm like, this is, <laughs> that's I'm what you just want. like swiveling hey, around think. in a chair. You Instagram, think. uh, Tedward underscore IG. Cause some poor loser is named Tedward out there. So I had the, I had to probably, bump, uh, it's probably a Theodore. <laughs> yeah. Another probably Tom, probably Tom Edwards. Uh, Patreon. Um, it's, it's slow, but it moves, you know, people, people, you'd be surprised. There's like 60 or 70 people out there that like, believe in me enough to chip in a few bucks a month. And that like means the world. To, it's funny. That is the most valuable paycheck I get every month where I'm like, I, I am so proud of that, where I'm like, someone cares enough to keep this enough, like alive where it's paying for some fuel, you know, it actually gets the job done. Uh, I'll, but that's I'll, much join, it. I'll join it. I'll join it right now. <laughs> um, and I, and I, and I like contribute nothing to it. It's like on the table. I'm like, look, I, you're not getting any extras. Like this is, I'm so busy and slammed. <laughs> I'm like, I'm just trying to do as much as I can. And occasionally I'll throw up a photo of something I'm doing, but like most of the time it's just like, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that's kind of the deal. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Well, it is. It's you. If you love, if you love a channel and you've been subscribed to it and you're, you're part of that community and you really want to make sure that it's the longevity and, and you got to help, them at some point so it's, it's it's a great cause to 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 put the money into you know what is it for the lowest he, starts, it's a, like, he has a dollar a month here. i'm going i'm going yeah. five dollars a month well, right now and that's at least <laughs> that's <laughs> one gallon of premium yeah it's one gallon of premium okay in, in, Cali just, in yeah. california no less yeah well just yeah. give me a shout out i just just say this gallon's for you as you shift through one gear on a sl65 amg black series next time you say this one's for you jp Gun. Yeah. Done. <laughs> Done. I'm in. Hey, hey man, this has been an absolute pleasure. You've opened my eyes to what what car a lot about cars. I knew uh, a love for cars, but I didn't know how deep the community really was. And I, I I'm I'm super stoked to see you. I can't wait to see where you go, and I can't wait till the first time I buy a vintage car, I can go and find exactly what it'll feel like. Um, and, and the driving experience. So thank you so much for coming on everyone. Thank you for listening and everything um, about him will be in the show notes below. Uh, yeah. We will see you guys next week with another car guy. Um, it'd be really exciting. So thanks. You guys. know him. You, do. you know him. You do. That dude in blue. That, du <laughs> that dude in blue. David Patterson. Hello, David, from the week before you are on. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, there, there you go. go. Thanks, guys. See you, Thank soon. you. See you next week.